Hi guys welcome back to another exciting video so seat back relax and let's get started. Kakin, Midoriya squealed. Pushing past a crowd of young children his best friend stood in the middle, absolutely swamped by the rest of the kindergarten. Kakin, Kakin, I heard you got your quirk today. He continued, finally reaching the center of the crowd where his childhood friend, Bakugo, was. Bakugo turned to face his friend. A wide grin plastered on his cheeks. Hell yeah I did. Look at this, Bakugo exclaimed. Shoving his palms right at Midoriya he watched in awe as Bakugo's hands lit up in a fiery fury. His ears filling with the sound of popping fireworks and nose with the slightest scent of caramel Bakugo made a few more small pops before eventually putting his hands back in his pockets, a smug smile now adorning his face. Cool right, he started. My mom's calling it explosion I can explode stuff with my hands. Oh my goodness that's amazing. Midoriya interrupted, his eyes bright in excitement. How does it work? Is it touch activated? Does it run off your stamina? What if your hands are underwater? Can you still activate it? What if you're... Sheesh nerd. Take a breath. Bakugo huffed. Rolling his eyes lazily Midoriya flushed. His eyes nervously trailing to look at his feet he knew of his rambling habit and how others felt uncomfortable about it. But sometimes he simply couldn't help it his brain ran faster than he could comprehend. It's bound to overheat sometimes. And his mouth simply acted as a cooling system of course. Trying to explain this was fruitless. So Midoriya ended up submitting to the silence and waited for Bakugo to continue. Apparently I sweat nitroglycerin or some shit. And that stuff's explosive one spark from my hands and boom. Bakugo shouted. Waving his arms in the air to emphasize his point Midoriya stood in amazement as the other kids around them gasped and cheered. Wow, Midoriya finally whispered out. You're going to be such an amazing hero Kakin. Damn right I will. Bakugo exclaimed. And once you get your quirk, we're gonna be the best hero duo the world's ever seen. With me as a pro. And you as my sidekick, nothing can stop us. Not even all might. Midoriya nodded eagerly. Brushing off the psychic comment sure he wanted to work with Bakugo, but he needed to be his own hero first a hero that was strong enough to help even if there was no one else around a hero that could save everybody, no matter what a hero that always smiled. Yeah, I can't wait, he responded. A hero like All Might, sorry kid, but it's not gonna happen, the quirk doctor stated bluntly, his bushy mustache flopping up with each word. Izuku's hands fell to his knees his eyes widened, full of shock and disbelief he wanted to frown or even open his mouth, but he was just stuck staring at the man who had just crushed his dreams. If only he knew just how many times that would happen. No, there must be some mistake. His mother, Inko, exclaimed, the other kindergartens have all started showing signs but, pardon my asking, ma'am, but your fourth generation, yes. The doctor interrupted, as far as quirks, I mean. Inko looked up hesitantly at Dr. Tsubasa, Izuku's quirk doctor, with a shy look in her eyes. Yes, of course, she started. I can pull small objects towards me she demonstrated, pulling one of her son's many All Might figurines towards her hand and my husband can breathe fire. Dr. Tsubasa looked at her, but Izuku couldn't pick out an emotion on his face his stare was simply blank and empty it unnerved the small boy. By the age of four, a child should manifest either one of his parents' quirks or a composite of the two, he stated, gesturing towards an x-ray of what Izuku presumed to be his foot however. Early quirk research discovered one important finding. The doctor moved his hand out of the way, then proceeded to point at a bone in the pinky toe of the x-ray. It has to do with the absence of an extra joint in the pinky toe humans have no need for parts they don't use, you see, he continued, bringing his arms back down to his lap, and those without the joint represent the next stage of evolution. Dr. Tsubasa then glanced at Izuku, before turning his chair completely towards Inko. Izuku here has two joints it's becoming quite rare nowadays, but Izuku couldn't brace himself for the words to come even if he knew they were coming. It would still hit as hard as it did. It's safe to say your son won't ever develop a quirk. The car ride. Home was silent. The way inside was silent. Even the lonely dinner as the two waited for Hisashi to come home was silent. Izuku had been in his room. When he heard the first noise since coming home from the doctor it was the loud sound of the front door slamming shut late into the night he shouldn't have been up. But the poor boy couldn't get a wink of sleep. The words still weighing heavy on his heart he listened, as the familiar jingle of Hisashi's keys stopped, meaning they had reached the hook where they always went he listened. As his dad addressed Inko, who was still in the kitchen he listened. As the soft murmuring of his mother's voice started, the first time he'd heard it since coming home he listened, as Hisashi finally understood the situation. That was when he had wished he could stop listening. Hisashi's voice picked up. Until it was full-blown yelling he could hear his mother crying back her soggy voice was a direct contrast to Hisashi's loud, violent screaming he tried to shut their voices out as best he could. But it was really no use Izuku wrapped himself up in his bedsheets, muffling out his tears until they were an inaudible sob. Don't you understand? How do you expect me to work like this? Hisashi's angry yell echoed from the kitchen. He's our son. Came in Ko's desperate cry. 
That quirkless freak is no son of mine if the word gets out. I'll lose my job, my reputation, everything. How could you say such a thing? How can you be so blind? Am I the only one looking at the bigger picture here? We can have another child. Hisashi's thundering footsteps then stomped from the kitchen to where the bedroom was a door creaked open violently. Then slammed shut Izuku could still hear his mother's sobs coming from the kitchen. Now drowning out his own he moved to lay on his side and pulled his tear-stained blanket up to cover his head clutching his favorite All Might plushie. He cried heavily into his pillow. I'm sorry mama, came a small, helpless cry from underneath the blanket, I'm sorry papa. Izuku didn't remove the blanket from over his head until he eventually fell asleep, but if he did, maybe he would have noticed the dark and towering figure that seemed to watch him from the corner of his bedroom. Or maybe not. The room was pitch black after all. Except for a small all-might night light plugged into an outlet right by his bedside the figure was easy to miss. As it blended right in with the rest of the shadows in the room it wouldn't be surprising if Izuku didn't spot it in his emotional state. What would be surprising is if he didn't notice how a second blanket, which just so happened to be his favorite all-might fleece, had been draped over him as he slept or maybe he did notice and just assumed it to have been his mother. The figure in the corner would have to disagree though. Izuku woke up the next morning to the sounds of birds chirping through his window he had been especially warm last night, but just attributed it to his mother covering him with his other blanket he squinted. Realizing his curtains had been drawn open he was positive he had closed them the night before must have been his mother when she came in to cover him. He drearily shuffled out of bed. Looking at the clock it was fairly early, around 7.30 he really didn't get much sleep last night but despite the grogginess, Izuku managed to dress himself in a comfortable shirt and a pair of green shorts before dragging himself out of his bedroom. The first thing he noticed was the lack of noise in the house, as well as the abundance of silence it was eerie, especially for a sad morning his mom would usually make scrambled eggs, an American breakfast staple he had grown to love, and the smell would lure him out of his bed and right to the table but there are no scrambled eggs on the table in fact. There was no one in the kitchen, which was odd as his mom always enjoyed a fresh cup of tea these mornings. The second thing he noticed was Hisashi's keys missing from their hook as Izuku walked to the front door to investigate, only to find that his father's shoes were also gone too his father rarely came home, as he worked a well-paying job overseas. But when he did, it was always on a weekend Hisashi loved playing with Izuku, especially at the neighboring park and on Sunday nights. Izuku would always wish that his dad could stay longer but alas, on Monday mornings, he would be gone again, never to return until who knew when however, his father leaving in the middle of the weekend was simply unheard of, much less on a Saturday morning he hadn't even stayed a full day. Izuku shook his head. His dad was probably just getting some groceries maybe they had run out of eggs. The third thing he noticed was a note taped to the refrigerator door it was written in his mother's handwriting. The slight curves to her T's and I's giving it away Izuku pulled it off the refrigerator and brought it close to his face. Dear Izuku, just wanted to tell you that I went out to buy some eggs I doubt you'll be up to read this, but I wrote it just in case I'm not sure where your father is. But if he comes home before I do, please be good call me on the house phone if you need anything you should remember my number. Love, Mommy. Izuku opened the fridge. There were still nine eggs left in the crate. He sighed and closed the refrigerator door. Moving over to the couch and reached for the remote if he had his mother's quirk, he wouldn't have to reach. Flipping through the channels, he hoped he could catch some of the early morning cartoons he usually missed. Maybe he could find a new episode of Mighty Adventures, a popular All Might-themed cartoon show he'd even be content with a rerun at this point anything to boost his dreary spirit. A noise came from the kitchen though. Stopping his surfing in its tracks he turned towards the sound, not really knowing what to expect but he certainly wasn't expecting this. A tall, shadowy figure stood right between the kitchen and the living room as Izuku couldn't make out any facial features as a dark hood was draped over its head the inside of the hood was pitch black, and despite his squinting, he could not see inside the hood was attached to a long flowing robe that hung heavily over its thin form. The sleeves and ends obviously too long a rope dangled from its neck, with a small stone-looking object tied to it the grey oval-shaped item looked to be painted with swirls and specks. Izuku was torn on whether to feel amazed or terrified at the thought of a stranger in his home he knew his emotions were thoroughly out of whack from yesterday. But even through his stupor and astonishment, he still managed to do what was considerably the dumbest thing he could have done in the moment. Are you my quirk mister? Izuku stammered out, though not stuttering, just simply confused by the situation in front of him. I am much worse, dear child, the figure said, a hint of sadness underlying in his voice. This is the unorthodox way that Japan's death met his successor where he has come to regret his retirement, wishing he would have stayed active for at least another decade or two. This is the first conversation Izuku ever had with Gami, who would go on to be one of Izuku's closest friends and eventually a part of his new family. And this is the story of how a quirkless boy became the greatest hero that Japan had ever seen while also becoming the first hero death in the history of existence. Izuku wasn't sure exactly how the situation in front of him had come to pass his young, 
four-year-old head was doing its best to process the words coming out of the figure he was so immersed by the complexity of this whole thing that Izuku completely missed the fact that the figure had sat next to him on the couch. So let me get this straight. Izuku started, you are death. I was death. So you're like not death anymore. Yes. How does that even work? Izuku sighed in desperation. That doesn't even make sense. I believe there are more pressing matters to deal with, he stated calmly, not at all annoyed by Izuku's endless questioning. Izuku looked up curiously that was true the figure hadn't really explained his purpose or objective to the boy yet it made him wonder why a being like himself would reveal his existence to a mere four-year-old child a quirkless one at that. As I said before, I was the embodiment of death at one point, he continued, it was my job to collect and sort the souls of all who roamed in my territory. Wait, territory. Izuku interrupted, there's more than one of you. Yes, the figure put quite bluntly. There are billions of souls on this plane I would get quite overwhelmed if I was alone. Ah, that is fair, Izuku murmured softly. The man continued, The role of death is oddly similar to an ordinary job we are allowed to retire and pass our job to others though, not without serving a minimum of a century's work. A century, Izuku cried. Yes, that is the minimum. But many deaths work for much longer I personally do not remember how long I worked I stopped counting five centuries in. Wow, Izuku stammered. That's a long time. Yes, but that is besides the point. He paused for a moment. Looking at the boy Izuku couldn't pick up on any facial expressions obviously, but by the way his shoulders slouched, he could tell these next few words were weighing on the mysterious man. Once a death wishes to be at peace, we are relieved from our duties someone else must take our place though our successors are not of our choosing, he stopped for a moment, before continuing with his thought. No one knows who chooses them really, but the previous death must meet with their successor to properly teach them how to execute the role. It was at that moment that Izuku's four-year-old brain finally put the pieces together with wide eyes. He finally broke eye contact with the figure, staring at his hands while picking at them nervously. I, the boy started, his mouth failing him, I'm your successor, aren't I? If I had known I was going to place such a burden on a child, I would have stuck it out another decade or so. The man had given Izuku some time to finally process all that had happened within. The last half hour for the young boy, no amount of time could ever be enough though the figure had insisted they get started as soon as possible, as Izuku was effectively the new death as soon as he had laid eyes on him. Izuku learned exactly what his new job was he had to sort the souls of beings who had recently passed, and assign them a realm of the afterlife to wander he could only sort one at a time. But once he held the soul, all the information of that being's lifespan would come to him. He and the man practiced a few times to get the hang of it. Izuku couldn't describe the feelings that washed through him as he held a soul but he could describe the souls themselves. The souls looked like small puffs of light they were all the same color. A light, washed out yellow that faded into a white. Almost like a light bulb when he held a soul. He could feel the rush of information to his head it made him a bit woozy the first few times. But Izuku had quickly grown to love the feeling he had always had a passion for analyzing though normally it was quirks, and not human lives, but it was a passion nonetheless. Sorting them though, was a whole different experience. When the figure first displayed how to summon the entries to the afterlife, Izuku was worried, and rightfully so how big were these entryways? Were they two-way transportation? Could something come out of them? The figure though had patiently sat through his mumblings, and finally responded with a simple just try it. And so Izuku did his best to copy the mysterious man's example, slowly swiping his arm in front of himself in a horizontal manner, while delicately concentrating on creating whatever the heck these entries were supposed to look like he was considerably started when three monochromatic flames appeared right before his eyes, simply floating in midair. There are three main layers to the afterlife, the figure began suddenly, startling the poor child even more. There is paradise, he stated, gesturing towards the first flame on the left, a white one that seemed to shine happily, for those who have done good in their lifespan, or properly made up for their evils. The figure then shifted towards a dreary, black flame all the way on the right, completely skipping the one in the middle. There is the underworld, he continued, for those who have committed considerable evils in their lifespan and could not make up for them. Finally, the figure turned to face the final flame, a light grey one that seemed to sway as if there was a light breeze coming from somewhere. Then there is purgatory, he finished, for those who had unfinished business in this plane or have committed minor evils and could not make up for them some souls simply wander purgatory because they are confused and cannot accept their situation unlike the other two areas. Souls in purgatory have a second chance to be moved to paradise or the underworld, though that decision isn't up to you. He stopped talking, giving the child time to register this new information it was a lot for the young boy to take in but he did his best to understand the gravity of the situation somehow. Through the muddy thoughts of All Might and Kakin and his parents and quirks, Izuku's head realized just how important of a job he had something he really couldn't afford to joke around with. Unlike the earlier topics, you must decide where each soul will go. That is your job. What? The boy exclaimed. Be but that's a huge responsibility. 
What if I get it wrong or I don't do good enough? What will happen to? You were chosen for this, he explained. They must have faith in you besides. If those who run each realm do not agree, they will simply send the soul back to you though. That is usually unlikely. I can only remember a few instances for myself each century. Izuku let out an audible sigh of relief at the figure's encouragement. Though, I must mention that each soul must be sorted and sent off within 24 hours of you receiving it. He added suddenly, This is one of the few major rules the higher-ups do not take lightly when this rule is broken. Izuku's relief quickly turned to sheer horror. But there are hundreds of souls here, he exclaimed, swinging his arms around himself to emphasize his point. W we've got to get started like right now. And so Izuku began sorting his first ever batch of souls. With the figure's guidance of course it was a lot of pressure to handle he was. Really surprised the child didn't break down at the sight of this responsibility but Izuku managed to hold it all in and honed in on the task at hand new souls trickled in as Izuku sorted the ones that the figure brought with him. But never enough that he felt overwhelmed he and the figure just kept working. They worked through the latest episode of Mighty Adventures. Missing it completely it had been a new episode too. They worked past lunch, with the boy grabbing a small granola bar from the cupboard his mother still wasn't home yet neither was his father. It was around 2 in the afternoon when the child heard the front door start to creak open he instinctively panicked. Afraid that whoever was about to walk in would discover his secret the figure managed to calm him down and reassured Izuku that only he could see the souls, flames, and the man himself the boy still insisted that they move to his room once he greeted whoever was at the door, preferring to keep his mumbles about the souls and their lives away from prying ears. It had been Inko who walked through the door she gasped at seeing her son on the couch. Staring right at her fumbling her hands around, she stuttered out a slight greeting before rushing to the kitchen, clearly not expecting the confrontation, if there even was one Izuku sighed heavily, before getting up to move to the solitude of his bedroom, the figure trailing behind. There were no grocery bags in her hands. Izuku and the figure continued to sort out souls, until the mysterious man told the child they could finally stop they had sent away. A good majority of the souls. And as long as Izuku kept tabs on which ones needed to be sorted soon, he could stop for the day the young boy used the free time to plan out a new schedule for himself. Concerning the souls and their time limits he figured that he'd need to sort at least three times a day and decided to correspond them to each meal he would have to get up early for the morning ones. As the amount of souls he would accumulate while sleeping would be enormous Izuku believed he could get away with eating lunch alone in the corner of the lunchroom for the afternoon sessions and lastly, he could sort more after dinner, where he would have the most time alone it would definitely be different, but he would still give it his all, as someone had chosen him for this role purposely. At least, that's what Izuku liked to think it was definitely a shock being quirkless, and after hearing his parents last night, the child was feeling quite dejected useless even. As his own father didn't accept him he was desperate to attach his newly fading hope to something. So realizing that he was effectively death's successor, his brain immediately turned to the fact that someone must have considered him worthy worthy of knowing the secrets of life after death. At least but that was enough for Izuku he was happy that someone still saw potential in him, even when he himself was doubting it. The mysterious man struck up conversation with the small boy. Once the silence set in for the first time that sat he explained that all death were gifted with powers to help them with their roles. Though at this point, it was mostly for aesthetics at the mention of powers. Izuku's head perked up the figure let out a slight chuckle at that, or at least Izuku thought it was a chuckle he promised to explain more in the morning, as today had definitely been long and eventful on its own disappointed. The small child nodded slowly and went back to figuring out his new schedule for school, writing it down in his quirk analysis notebook. With a few footnotes here and there the silence was eating away at the young boy, as he tapped his pencil on the wooden desk where he often wrote his quirk analysis. So, do you have a name? Izuku started, seemingly out of nowhere. I mean, I can't keep calling you Mr. All the time. Well, I won't be around much longer, the figure responded. W what? What do you mean? Izuku cried in disbelief the mysterious man couldn't leave him yet they had gotten along so well. I did retire for a reason, he stated harshly. Once I finish teaching you the basics, I'm off to finally rest. Oh oh, Izuku whispered he did have a point, even if it did break the child's tiny heart. He started up again. As for my name, I'm afraid I don't remember it I've lost most of my memories to time itself it happens when you work for centuries on end. Izuku looked up pitifully how sad it must be to not even know your own name. While I could, the boy hushed, I could give you one. The figure turned to the child with a curious stance. Well, I suppose that is all right just make it appropriate. Izuku grinned widely. Bouncing in his chair his mind picked itself for a good name that the man might enjoy something classy. Or maybe something more unique. Izuku wasn't too sure what his preferences might be. What what about Gami? Izuku murmured the man shifted his head. 
but made no noise that confirmed or denied the name Izuku became nervous and focused more on his hands like Shinigami. But shorter, since you were a death at one point it fits you, but leaves just enough mystery to grow into its own name, completely separate from its original meaning. The figure stared blankly for a few more seconds Gami I like it. Izuku was pleased with himself, and Gami couldn't help but relax at the sight of the cheerful, four-year-old boy happily swaying in his chair. The sight of childhood innocence what a wonderfully ignorant feeling Gami felt slightly uplifted at the fact that Izuku was in his own little world right now hopefully he would stay that way for the night. Then maybe Izuku wouldn't have to hear the fact that two voices were currently screaming at each other in the kitchen. Gami really didn't like that man. Izuku woke up the next morning with a groan. Squinting as he sat up from his bed the curtains had been widely drawn and the early sunrise was seeping through his windows this must have been Gami's way of waking him up. And while Izuku appreciated it, he sure wasn't used to waking up this early the boy turned to the All Might clock that rested on his nights and it displayed a bright 5.34am in a red glow Izuku sighed and turned off the clock so the programmed alarm wouldn't ring. Then headed towards his desk adjusting to this new schedule might be harder than he initially thought. Quietly, Izuku pulled out the chair. Before plopping himself down and scooting it back in place Gami watched proudly as the small child waved out his hand. Summoning the monochromatic flames effortlessly he then reached a thin hand for one of the many souls surrounding the boy before picking it up and handing it to him. Here, Gami stated softly, I will bring you the ones closest to expiring that way you can work more efficiently. Izuku managed to lift his tired face into a smile that simply lit up Gami's dull heart he couldn't explain but seeing the young boy so happy filled him with such a warm and comforting feeling it was like Izuku's positivity radiated off of him, as if it was contagious he wanted so badly to get attached. But he reminded himself that he was only here to help Izuku learn his new role after all. He retired so that he could finally move on there was just no way he could let himself get attached. Ah, thank you Gami, Izuku whispered tiredly, grabbing the orb of light that his friend had handed him could he even consider Gami a friend? Izuku wanted to. But he wasn't sure the man had felt the same hearing him say that his stay was only temporary brought heaviness to the boy's heart he enjoyed Gami's company so much, even though they had met less than a day ago. But who was he to deny the rest of a man who had worked non-stop for over five centuries? Trying to keep Gami around for his own happiness just seemed too cruel. The two of them didn't say any of this out loud. Of course they just continued to work in silence. Gami passing souls to Izuku as he sorted them they flowed together rather well. Like a well-oiled machine the silence wasn't necessarily awkward. Both of them could tell the other was itching to speak, but silence was appropriate for the moment for Gami. It was early and Izuku was still tired he didn't want to wear the boy down more than he already was for Izuku. It was early and his parents were still asleep sure he wanted to talk with Gami. But the fear of one of his parents stumbling in on him sitting at his desk, seemingly talking to no one, early in the morning was enough to keep him silent. It was around 6.15ish when the silence was disturbed. Not by one of them, but by the sound of a door closing Izuku froze in his tracks, completely still, and slowly turned his head towards the door he could hear footsteps in the hallway coming towards his room he turned to Gami, unsure of what to do as the footsteps came closer Gami shrugged indifferently. But Izuku could tell by his posture that the man was panicked as well trying to get back to bed wasn't an option, as he would make way too much noise and give himself away nor was hiding under his desk, as whoever walked in would clearly see that the room was empty and start searching for Izuku, which would only lead to more problems so Izuku braced himself as the footsteps got even closer, rehearsing a half-baked explanation of exactly what he was doing out of bed. But the footsteps didn't stop at his door like he was expecting instead. They walked right past it and continued down the hallway Izuku let out an inaudible breath he didn't know he was holding, and slowly got out of the desk chair ever so quietly. He creeped towards his door and pressed his ear against the hardwood Gami followed him silently and stood at the wall next to the door there. The two listened. They listened as the footsteps finally stopped, reaching what Izuku assumed to be the front door. They listened as he could make out the sound of shoes being slipped on and sliding against the doormat. They listened as the familiar jingle of keys being taken off their designated hook rang out in the hallway just soft enough that anyone asleep would completely miss it. They listened as the front door opened and then closed. Izuku managed to get back to working after the tension of almost getting caught but not really he and Gami had no further interruptions for the rest of the morning it was only around. Two hours later, about eight-ish, that Gami insisted that the boy could stop, clarifying that the oldest soul currently still had eight hours left before it reached. The time limit Izuku sighed in content, leaning back in his chair to relax it was still early, and he doubted that his mother was up yet looking around. He figured it wouldn't be too bad if he left his room so that's what the boy did. Carefully opening his bedroom door so as to not make a sound, Gami close behind. He slinked into the kitchen, grabbing the box of Mighty Smack's cereal quietly from the countertop it was his favorite cereal. 
Though quite sugary he poured himself a bowl as best he could, spilling a bit here and there putting the box back and cleaning up his mess. Izuku took his dry cereal to the living room, where he softly dropped himself on the couch Gami followed him into the room but trailed behind, looking around the room itself. There were few pictures on the walls, but most of them were of Izuku and his mother they looked happy together, with the young boy smiling brightly and each one and co smiled as well. But nothing could ever compare to the ball of sunshine that was his successor it was like Gami could see the physical waves of happiness rolling off the child in each photograph. There was one picture with Hisashi. It was of his wedding day he and Inko stood in the center of a large, white archway, decorated with beautiful red roses and Ko herself looked happier than all the other photos combined. Holding her bouquet of roses with a gorgeous smile Hisashi looked happy as well. Though the man seemed to remain stoic most of the time in this picture, it almost seemed as if Hisashi had been fighting back a smile. But there were no pictures of Izuku and Hisashi together, which Gami found odd sure, he didn't like the man. But it didn't make much sense for a father to not have any photos with his son he had only been around Izuku for a day. But judging off of that, he could see that his successor didn't have a good relationship with the man. At least not anymore Gami has thought that this was a new development. But judging by the absence of father and son photographs, he was afraid it stemmed farther than that of course. He wouldn't dare ask the boy was probably still overwhelmed with all the responsibility he'd had to tackle in the last day Gami didn't want to burden him more with bad memories. Hey Gami, are you going to sit? Izuku piped up, patting his small hand on the empty spot of the couch the man didn't realize he had been staring at the wall for so long. But he nodded his head and moved over to the couch the child smirked as he turned on the TV, immediately beelining for a specific channel. Izuku inwardly cheered as he saw that the channel was playing the new Mighty Adventures episode he had missed the other day putting down the remote. He happily smacked away at his serial content in the moment. Gami didn't understand the appeal of the show he for one thought the main character, Mighty Man, was foolish and reckless. Overall a bad example for young children to be looking up to but seeing the smile on his successor's face, Gami pushed those thoughts away. If Izuku liked it, then Gami would give it a chance. And Ko definitely was startled seeing her son up so early. Watching Mighty Adventures while eating cereal she really hadn't expected him to be up, so she fumbled out a good morning before rushing to the kitchen she kept telling herself that her son must have some crazy new schedule. But in reality, she knew exactly what it was it was the same thing eating at her as well. The part two nights had been stressful for the mom she felt torn in two directions she could understand where her husband was coming from. But at the same time, Izuku was her son she couldn't just leave him he was for, for goodness sake she shook her head sadly, pouring herself a warm cup of tea she just needed more time to think. That was all seeing Izuku up so early didn't really help with her guilt either in the rush of the moment, and Ko made a poor decision, the first of many to come. Izuku, she started, suddenly pouring her cup of tea into a thermos, I'm going out to buy some groceries. Her son turned to her, pausing his cartoon, looking as if he wanted to say something his eyes were big, watery, and sad and Ko jerked her head away from him quickly, not wanting to see his expression, or feel the guilt after unbeknownst to her. At her actions, Izuku grew even more depressed, feeling more unwanted than ever. Oh okay mama, he whimpered goodness. His voice sounded so pathetic and Ko cringed, desperate to leave the situation. You know the rules no leaving the house for any reason if you need me. Call, she repeated monotonously, quickly adding on, if your father comes home, be good. The child just nodded his head, not trusting his voice to respond without crying. And Ko left in a rush, not even bothering to grab a jacket or her purse. Gami could feel the sadness coming off his successor. And honestly, he couldn't blame him what his mother had just done was harsh and ignorant, and frankly, he was starting to believe all the adults in this household were complete idiots. Kami had never been good with kids, but seeing the boy look so dejected left a sour taste in his mouth, so he did his best. I did promise you that I would explain about those powers, he piped up, remembering Izuku's bright face when he first mentioned them yesterday though, I will alert you that they are not easy to control. Izuku's head shot up, wide-eyed and curious, but I suppose that will not stop you. The child shook his head, eager to know where Gami was going the episode of Mighty Adventures was still paused. The man put his hands forth, gesturing for the boy to meet them Izuku hesitantly raised his arms to touch Gami's he was expecting that man to be ice cold, and he was Gami's skeletal hands that peeked out from under his sleeves were so freezing. He almost flinched away from the touch but the figure didn't seem to notice, now grasping Izuku's small wrists in each hand. The first ability I will educate you on is named Death's Touch. He pressed on, and we are starting with it first because it is the most dangerous. The child grew to eyed at the name of this power death's touch. Did that mean he could kill what he touched? Izuku shivered at the fact, or it could have been Gami's ice-cold hands. He wasn't too sure at this point. Death's touch works similarly to a decay quirk. He tried to put it in the best way for his successor to understand, 
It begins to decay anything you touch, regardless of the amount of fingers. That is why I grabbed your hands it is known to escalate with one's emotional state. Well that's fair, Izuku thought he probably would have grabbed the couch in terror if Gami wasn't holding on to him. Your subconscious controls this ability. However, with the proper training, you can learn to control certain aspects of this power we cannot practice now unfortunately. As you would likely destroy many things in this house however, we can tomorrow, as you will be outside for recess. The boy nodded at that the woods during recess was probably the best place to practice he just had to make sure Kakin or the others didn't go with him. For now, just be weary of what you touch you may accidentally activate it. Izuku gulped nervously how hard could that be? A few spoons and a cabinet handle were missing by the time Inko came home. Izuku had been sorting his nightly batch of souls when his father came home. He had tried to drown out the yelling. But nothing could do much against his father's harsh and violent voice. Gami was trying his best to distract him, but there was only so much the poor man could do. The boy just took a deep breath and intensified his gaze on the soul in his hands. He hummed quietly to himself, just a last ditch attempt to fill his mind with anything but yelling. Izuku was sure it would pass, as it did for the nights before. He just needed to wait. Then, a slap echoed from the kitchen. His mother's voice stopped. Izuku froze in his tracks for the second time that day. All he could hear was his father's yelling. Not his own humming, not Gami's desperate cries to grab his attention, not even his mother. The child didn't realize he had gotten up from his chair. He didn't realize he had left the safety of his bedroom. He didn't realize that he was now standing in the kitchen, shielding his mother's fallen body with his own. Papa please stop. Izuku cried. Not knowing what else to do he raised his hands out at his sides, trying to take the target off his mother. You corkless misfit. Hisashi yelled, get out of my way. He cried harder, please papa, please. I said get out of my way. Izuku didn't really remember much after that just that he was hot so hot his chest felt the worst though it was hot and itchy. And the boy just wanted to scratch it although he did remember his mother's scream. Hopefully she didn't get hurt if only he was stronger if only he had a quirk then maybe he could have protected his mama better her scream will forever haunt him. He also remembered Hisashi saying something to him. But not exactly what what he did remember was the laughing his father's laughter, bouncing around in his head, taunting him, like hyena cackling. But with a slight cough to it almost like his father's throat was filled with smoke his eyes were screwed shut, so all he could hear was the laughing what was so funny, especially when Izuku was hurting. He wished he could have asked maybe next weekend, maybe next visit. The next visit never comes. Izuku woke up for school the next day with bandages wrapped around his chest and shoulder it still burns Gami is at his bedside. Asking if he is alright Izuku really isn't sure. On his way out, the boy sneaks a glance at his mother in her bedroom. She doesn't have any bandages. School itself had really been awful. Word had somehow gotten around that Midoriya was quirkless he hadn't even said anything yet the children were just about as accepting as his father they surrounded him like they did when Kakin got his quirk. But it clearly wasn't the same. He wished that they would at least stop hitting the spot where his bandages are. But surprisingly, it wasn't one of the punches that hurt the most, it was what Kakin, his bestest friend in the whole wide world, said to him. What a disappointment, he started, I can't have a worthless Deku as my psychic. Iba Kakin, Midoriya cried, I can still be a hero. We can still save people together. You really don't get it. Bakugo continued, how the hell can a quirkless, useless Deku like you ever be a hero? Midoriya had never wanted to cry harder than in that moment he felt so lost, so alone the only thing reminding him that he still existed was Gami's hand ruffling his hair the only thing he was looking forward to at this point was Gami's company. Recess can't come fast enough, so death's touch works like a decay quirk it affects both living and non-living things. Midoriya did his best to pay attention. Right now, this power is extremely volatile you could end up accidentally decaying something you didn't mean to but with the right practice, you can learn to control it better. Gami pointed one of his thin fingers towards a leaf lying on the ground. Pick up that leaf over there, and then decay it. Midoriya went to grab the leaf, but just as he touched it, it shriveled up completely and wilted away. Gami looked a bit confused, but the child couldn't really tell. Try that other leaf, he said gesturing towards another fallen leaf. The boy went to pick up the other leaf, but the exact same thing happened. Gami didn't really know what to do. Maybe try that rock over there. Midoriya hesitantly grabbed the rock, but nothing happened he picked it up and tossed it from hand to hand the rock stayed complete. Alright, now try to. But before Gami could finish, the rock started to crack his successor dropped the rock in something of shock and horror the rock landed with a soft thud on the dusty ground, but continued to crack chunks of the stone started to flake off, before eventually the whole rock was lost to the breeze. Gami sighed this might be harder than he thought. After recess, Gami and Midoriya had gotten a good handle on what he could and couldn't do with Death's Touch, mostly due to Gami's experience with the power and Midoriya's analysis skills both were tired. But feeling proud of the progress made today it was discovered that the power was harder for the boy to control on plants, but easier on non-living objects granted. 
The duo still didn't know where humans or animals fit on that scale there was still a lot of work to be done, but the man and his successor were feeling quite good about themselves in the moment. That is, until Bakugo and the others showed up. So Deku, where were you at recess today? One of Bakugo's underlings sneered. I, I was just hanging near the forest, Midoriya whimpered. So you think you're too cool to hang out with us anymore? Another jumped in. And no, that's not it at all. The child cried desperately. Bakugo looked at Midoriya with a side glare his fingers twitched at the sight of his now useless friend how could he do this to him? How could Deku ruin his dream like this? Suddenly, Bakugo's hands pushed at Midoriya's chest, and the smaller boy fell to the ground Bakugo took a few steps forward and towered over his ex-best friend he held out a hand, as if he was offering to hoist him back up, only to explode the air in his palm moments later, making Midoriya flinch further into the dirt. Just remember your place Deku. He scowled, don't forget exactly how useless you are. Bakugo turned and walked off, the rest of his lackeys following him Midoriya sat up the best he could with the pain in his chest, and brought his arms up to his face and cried he felt Gami's arms wrap around him, the soft robe rubbing against his skin. Gami's heart broke as the boy cried harder. Midoriya was out of breath, his small eight-year-old legs burning as he ran down the empty alleyway he could hear the voices of Bakugo and the others behind him. Way too close for comfort he desperately pushed himself to move fast, turning onto a street in front of his elementary school he looked around. Urgently searching for a new place to hide suddenly, Midoriya felt a tug on his sleeve and turned around in panic, only to see that it was just Gami trying to get his attention. Izu, you should be able to lose them in the forest near the schoolyard, Gami suggested. His voice oddly calm the man tended to be much more reserved. But Midoriya learned how to pick up on his small hints of emotions Gami wasn't apathetic, just unusually composed. But that was to be expected of a man who worked for centuries non-stop he'd probably seen it all. Shaking out of his thoughts, Midoriya rushed towards the forest. The others hot on his tail the boy had been lucky enough to shake them once today. He really didn't want to get caught and test his luck again weaving through the trees at the forest entrance. He ducked behind a particularly thin one even Bakugo. As smart as he was, wouldn't think to look for him there at least. Midoriya hoped he wouldn't. Come on Deku, if you really want to be a hero, you'd face us head on. One of the bullies scoffed, but Midoriya knew better facing them head on would only result in himself getting hurt he was heavily outnumbered. With Bakugo's group having a count of four. Not including Bakugo himself as cowardly as they thought it was, Midoriya knew it was his best option a tactical retreat, as he liked to think of it. How did he even escape? Another whispered. The wooden fence behind him just broke. The third murmured back. It must have been old or something. I don't know man, it looked pretty new to me. Midoriya flinched at the last comment he already felt bad about decaying the fence to escape. There was no need to remind him he was just desperate. And you know what they say about a caged animal. Will you extras just shut up for a second? Bakugo shouted the kids around him quickly closed their mouths. He looked around with an angry scowl on his face. Deku has to be here somewhere, so stop talking and start searching. The other bullies scattered around the edge of the woods, scanning for any sign of the small, green child Midoriya could pick out the identity of each one by their footsteps, a trick he'd had to learn, unfortunately. Especially Bakugo's loud and harsh tread he recoiled and held his breath as Bakugo's steps came nervously close to the tree he was hiding behind he could hear the tree leaves rustling in the tense silence that surrounded him Midoriya could hear excessive rustling in one tree in particular, much more than what the wind could produce if the situation was different. He would have loved to investigate he was still curious though, maybe it was an animal. Ugh, Bakugo groaned. He must have left while you idiots were talking let's just go. Midoriya let out a shaky sigh of relief at the sound of footsteps exiting the woods his clammy hands finally stopped shaking as he clutched his chest how close had he come to being caught. How close had he come to having a heart attack for goodness sake. He spiraled down into his own mind further and further, his breaths turning to pain gasps he could feel Gami's cold hands on his shoulder, shaking him lightly. But he couldn't hear the man's voice all he could hear was the relentless taunting he endured each day at school over and over and over and over. Suddenly, a small mass leaped from the tree that had caught the boy's attention earlier. Now breaking Midoriya out of his trance he could now hear Gami's voice, but was more focused on the meager creature strutting towards him. Is that a cat? Midoriya blurted out. I believe it is, Gami responded nonchalantly. The boy looked at it with interest it was a small, black cat, with what Midoriya assumed to be white paws however. They were no longer white, more like a faded shade of brown from the forest dirt its wide, yellow eyes stared up at the child. Now having arrived at his feet he never had a cat before, much less been this close to one actually. Midoriya had never been this close to any animal since he gained death's touch. The cat rubbed up against the boy's thin legs, making him flinch further into the tree he was hiding behind he reminded himself why he could never own a pet as much as he wanted one. The cat seems to have taken a liking to you, the man stated, why don't you bring him home? You know I can't do that, he answered somberly. I wouldn't even be able to touch him he looked down at his hands in anguish. 
but you have progressed so well with Death's Touch in the past four years. Yeah, but I don't have any control over it with animals I've never dared to try for what I know. The second I touched this cat, he would start to disintegrate he's better off here. Midoriya turned away from the cat sorrowfully. Ignoring the creature's meowing he slowly made his way out of the forest, but the cat wouldn't relent. Simply sticking to the boy's trail he continued walking down the street towards his house pitifully. Doing his best to avoid listening to the cat's cries Gami stared at his successor with guilt. He wished he had waited a decade or so longer. Izuku arrived at home a bit later than usual, but wasn't too concerned he opened the front door to find no one inside. Like normal his mother was off working her late nursing shifts, the job she picked up once Hisashi left. Hisashi never came back after that night. He actually stopped contacting the family and general he and Inko were still legally married, but he simply stopped coming home or sending money. Forcing Inko to get a job she took up her old nursing practices and found work at a local hospital. But she always took the later shifts Izuku hoped that she didn't have a reason behind it. But inside he knew it was to avoid seeing him their relationship had gotten pretty rocky since Hisashi left he'd like to believe that she didn't blame him. But he knew better he hated how his brain was always right. Izuku threw his tattered bag onto the couch and searched the refrigerator for leftovers the young boy really didn't feel like cooking for himself tonight after the whole mess with Bakugo luckily. He found some old katsudan he made from a few nights before, so he took that out and started up the microwave to reheat it. Gami plopped himself down on the couch right next to Izuku's bag and patiently waited for his successor to turn on the TV. It wasn't long before Izuku returned with a plate of hot katsudan, setting it down on the small coffee table before grabbing the remote he turned on the TV. Immediately switching it to the channel with all the kids' cartoons unfortunately for him, he had just missed Mighty Adventures. But the current show playing, Shurusagi, was still one of his favorites. Inspired heavily off of the pro hero Mirko, the show's protagonist was a white rabbit named Shurusagi who was young and brash, very similar to Mirko's own personality Shurusagi was a bit of a troublemaker though, and he often got his friends in all sorts of messes they'd always have to work together to get out of those situations, and Shurusagi never escaped his consequences. Izuku liked that he wished the real world was like Shurusaga's full of friends and proper consequences. He was pretty engrossed in the current episode, even though it was a rerun, when Gami's voice snapped him to attention. You know Izu, I think you've gotten quite far in controlling Death's touch. If this is about earlier, Izuku sighed drearily, pausing the show, look, I'm sorry. I simply do not understand I know you cannot control it yet on plant life, but you have come so far with Death's touch and other aspects why are you still afraid? The boy stared at his hands, I'm just afraid that I'll mess up and hurt someone really bad. What do you mean? You have learned to control it on humans you can even start and stop the decay at will on them, as well as non-living objects that takes an impressive amount of skill and yet you have done it. Izuku shuddered at that thought learning to control his deadly power on other people was one of the first things on his bucket list, but also the most difficult he really didn't mean to practice on Bakugo's lackey, but they were always touching him, so he figured he'd touch back though he never hurt any of them. The amount of guilt he compiled from each time he tried really made the child fear his own power. Well, I'm still afraid that I could lose control one mistake and people would fear me forever I can't take that chance that's the whole reason I wear these. Izuku gestured to his hands as he shook them his hands were covered under black polyester gloves he'd started buying them at a local convenience store when Gummy first started teaching him to control death's touch of course these weren't the original pair he had gone through a good amount of gloves during the four years, well over a few hundred as cheap as the gloves were. The cost piled up over time, so the boy had resorted to doing odd jobs for others in nearby neighborhoods most of the people here knew about his quirklessness and wouldn't accept him to do their requests. But the nearby neighborhoods didn't, so he often went there for cash. I know you say I should be proud of my abilities, and I am, but I'm still scared people already hate me cause I'm quirkless, I just don't want them to hate me more for having a dangerous power I can't really control. Gami rested a thin, bony hand on his successor's gloved one I think I understand now but I will tell you, no matter what, I will support you you are my friend Izu, and nothing you do will change that. Izuku smiled at Gami's words it was reassuring to hear them from the normally quiet man he didn't have to respond. But Gami knew exactly what the boy was trying to say the two of them had grown to understand each other, even without verbal communication. Gami patted the couch a few times, and Izuku chuckled before unpausing the episode of Shurusagi. Izuku and Gami had lost track of time, something they almost never did it was too dangerous to do. Kind of like forgetting to send a soul away before its limit you just didn't forget those kinds of things and so Izuku and Gami always remembered to file away into the former's room before Inko got home but today was a different day maybe it was because it was so emotionally draining or maybe it was because Izuku was so exhausted from actually managing to escape back Hugo, a feat he never managed to do before who knows. It really didn't matter what mattered was that Inko came home and Izuku was still on the couch. Izuku knew that his mother didn't enjoy having to go back into work, 
but her taking the later shifts made it more bearable Izuku liked to pretend that his mother didn't take the later shift solely to get away from him. But one thing he definitely knew was that she took the later shift so she could drink. The boy knew his mother gained a drinking problem once Hisashi left it started out with spiked tea every once in a while and just escalated from there his mother would often come home drunk. Carrying a bottle of half-empty liquor she would buy after hours it was a surprise the first few times. But after a couple days of picking out glass shards from his skin, he eventually learned to shuttle away into his room before she came home. Unfortunately, he and Gami had lost track of time. Izuku fumbled for the remote, and in a panic, shut off the TV he ducked behind the couch. Hoping his mother hadn't noticed him there it didn't matter that the empty plate of katsudan was still on the coffee table he doubted she would notice that in her drunken state, and he could always clean it up later. But as Inko's sickeningly sweet voice came from the front door, Izuku knew he would have to face the consequences of his actions, just like Shurusagi. Izuku, she slurred, is that you my baby? The child looked to Gami in horror as the man motioned for him to respond but the boy's mouth failed him as he sputtered out silence. Oh Izuku. Inko's voice wavered, losing its sweetness, I know you're there there's no use hiding from me. He could hear his mother take a swig from the bottle she inevitably had in her hand. She let out a relieved gasp at the taste of the bitter drink down her throat. The boy didn't dare attempt to peek out from behind the couch, but visibly paled at the sound of footsteps coming closer. He wasn't sure what to do should he make a run for his room. Should he just try and wait it out? Izuku was stuck in his own head again. Slowly drowning himself in his panic he couldn't hear Gami urging him to just get up and run, nor his mother creeping closer. What are you doing on the floor there, Izuku dear? His mother garbled. Leaning over the couch to look at him she swung her arm holding the bottle over the side as well. Spilling a bit onto the cushions Izuku's nose filled with the pungent scent of alcohol in the air. As well as on his mother's breath he looked up in fear from the floor. His wide eyes meeting the half-lidded ones belonging to his mother she stared right back at him, an unnerving smile blooming on her rosy face. Have I ever told you how much you look like your father? Inko continued. As if not at all concerned by her child's reaction towards her she reached her free hand over the couch to grab at her son. But he flinched further into the floor. Away from her hand she scowled at that, but pulled her hand back to steady her swaying self with the couch. It made me so sad when he left. She proceeded how could you make your own mother so sad? Izuku knew he was to blame for his father's departure or at least his quirklessness was but hearing it from his mother just reminded him how much of a failure he really was he really wanted to make her proud, honest, but he just didn't know how. Why oh why, Inko cried. Why have you done this to me Izuku? Suddenly, Inko lunged over the couch towards her son the child yelped and scrambled to his feet he could hear his mother's jumbled words behind him. But the sound of his heartbeat in his ears was too overwhelming an abrupt crash came from the living room. His mother must have fallen into the coffee table, which a following shriek confirmed Izuku shuddered. That would only make her more angry he turned the corner and dashed towards his room the door was so close he could almost reach it. Then, white hot pain shot through his legs, and the boy wailed in anguish he didn't even notice the loud smash that came after, or the now invasive smell of liquor that flooded the hallway luckily. He was just at his door and managed to hobble inside and shut it his hands quickly flew to the doorknob and locked it as his mother's drunken footsteps scurried towards his door Izuku stumbled back onto his injured legs in fear as Inko bashed her fists on the wood. Why did you drive Hisashi away from me? She sobbed. Why did you have to be quirkless? Don't you realize what you have done to me? The boy sobbed along with his mother at her words. Though his cries were fairly drowned out he could feel Gami's sleeved hand ruffling through his unruly hair, which made him smile a bit he sniffled and rubbed his puffy eyes. Taking the time to try and get his breathing under control Izuku eventually managed to tune his mother's grieving out of his head until it inevitably stopped and she shuffled off. Probably still woozy from the alcohol the child sighed in relief it was finally over. Izu, I think we should fix up your legs. He spoke softly Izuku thought maybe it was because of the whole fiasco with his mother just now, but Gami must have seen everything in his time as death he wouldn't be shocked at witnessing this, right? Taking note of the man's strange behavior, the boy turned to examine his legs they were in rough shape, but not the worst he'd seen he started carefully picking out the glass bottle shards and tossing them in the trash the smaller pieces were a bit tricky, but with his tiny fingers, Izuku managed to get them out fortunately, most of the bottle missed his form and hit the wall instead and any that did hit him only landed in his calves, so he wasn't picking out glass for too long he was about to stumble towards the desk drawer that contained his supply of bandages. When Gami handed him the very item he was looking for the child looked surprised for a moment, but thankfully accepted the help. Gami couldn't often interact with solid objects he was, in all technicality, a spirit after all but he did have his instances where he could touch something physical after numerous months of practice attempts and many funny failures. 
The man did learn how to sit on the couch, and even lean back into it he still had extreme difficulty interacting with anything else other than the couch. But there were moments where he seemed to be able to flawlessly Izuku wasn't sure if it was out of desperation or something akin to extreme emotion, but it happened few and far between. As for why he had bandages in his room, well, he couldn't make it to the bathroom all the time. The next day was thankfully a seri, and on these days, his mother left the house early Izuku didn't have to worry about accidentally running into her on his way to the kitchen, which was a blessing in itself though today. The boy seemed to be a bit slower than usual, somewhat less hyper. He didn't pour his mighty smacks as happily, nor make as much of a mess he sort of shuffled towards the couch instead of his usual skipping, and didn't plop himself down it was more like a gentle fall. But when Gami watched his successor skip past the channel playing Mighty Adventures, he knew something was wrong. Izu, you see more down than normal or yesterday's events bothering you. Izuku looked down with a curious emotion on his face, one that Gami couldn't really identify. No no, it's not that I just had a really weird dream last night and it's really bugging me. The cloaked man looked at the boy in interest. A dream? Do you think? Talking about it might help. Well, he started. I saw a man I didn't know in it he looked a bit old, with fraying brown hair that looked faded for some reason. I can vividly remember him wearing a bright yellow shirt Izuku stopped timidly, but Gami motioned for him to continue. He, um, started to cross the street, but there was a car coming and H he didn't see it he just kept walking when he f finally noticed it, it was too late. The boy managed to whimper out. Their W was so much BLDA and it was awful Izuku sniffled and rubbed at his nose, clearly not having enjoyed retelling his dream. The man stayed silent for a moment, unsure of what to say. Izu, I think you received another one of those powers I told you about. That was a power. Izuku cried out, I don't want to have to see that again. I understand that you are in shock, but that is one of the most useful abilities you will ever have it may help you save even more people. The child calmed down a little at those words, it can. Yes, that is an ability called premonition it allows the current death to view people who could die earlier than they are supposed to. Gami paused, allowing his successor to process those words before continuing. Normally, we are not to interfere with the process of death, however, we can receive foresight of people who are going to die before their supposed date those viewed in premonitions can have their fates tampered with of course, us death are not obligated to interfere, however we are given that option. Izuku looked up at that, I can save that man then. Yes, but I will warn you, it is difficult to predict when a premonition will come to pass they usually have a time frame of anywhere between an hour after you first viewed it to about three days later. The boy's face morphed again into one of horror, so he could be dead already. Possibly, Izuku paled. Gami flinched a bit, but it wasn't noticeable he didn't mean to scare the young child again. Do you remember what the sky looked like in the premonition? If it wasn't dark, then he could still be alive. Izuku perked up again. Yeah, it was sunset. He's still okay then. Gami smiled, though it wasn't visible from the depths of his hood. You enjoy analyzing things, so try to observe as much as you can during each premonition. That way you can have the best chance at helping the person in it normally. They appear as foresights during the day, not typically as dreams, though that must be because this was your first one. The man stopped to ponder that thought, before picking up where he left off, although, you have to be careful when you intervene too early, and the person could still die too late. And that's self-explanatory you have to interfere at the moment closest to death. The boy grew a bit worried at that, but shook it off. Well then, I guess we are going out to buy some groceries later. Izuku then switched the channel to the kids' cartoons, where Mighty Adventures was playing. Gami smiled wider at his successor. He was going to make such a wonderful hero. Izuku trudged towards his house, his arms full of groceries bags Gami did offer to help. But with the man's sporadic control over his form, neither of them really trusted that he would be able to make it back without dropping at least one bag and squishing its contents the sun was setting majestically. And as much as the child enjoyed watching it, he knew he had to head back soon being out after dark wasn't too good of an idea in this neighborhood. The boy was secretly hoping to see the man from his premonition, but took into account that his foresights could take up to three days later to come true he knew it was unlikely for it to occur so early. But Izuku could only hope after seeing the man's gruesome death in his own mind. He wished to spare him of that avoidable fate. He and Gami liked to walk and talk while they were out of course. They chatted sparingly when others were around or as others passed them but at times like this, where the streets were eerily empty, they talked plentifully after all. The man had been around for over five centuries. He sure had a lot to talk about. They turned a corner together. Gami rambling on about some odd quirks he'd seen throughout their newfound generations the man knew his successor enjoyed that kind of conversation, and also knew he had somehow picked up the child's rambling habit the two of them were so engrossed in the discussion. They almost crossed during a green traffic light but Gami managed to alert Izuku once they got to the curb, and the eight-year-old stopped accordingly they continued to chat though. The light turned yellow, 
As they talked, the boy noticed something odd in the corner of his eye as he turned his head. The sight of a bright yellow shirt flooded his vision realization bloomed in his head as he saw the older, brown-haired man from his premonition crossing the street across from Izuku, right as a car was plowing down towards him. Stop mister. The words escaped his mouth before he had even realized it. Gami turned to look at what his successor was yelling about, not really expecting to see the man Izuku had described earlier. The man jolted and stopped at the child's scream, just as the raging car zoomed past him. Just then, the traffic light turned red. Izuku used the opportunity to run across the now empty road after looking both ways he rushed towards the shaken man and tried to aid him the best he could. Mister, are you alright? Izuku asked softly, genuine concern evident in his voice. The man managed to get his breathing under control enough to respond. Yes, thanks to you, he started. My quirk's side effect can make me go blind at random I thought I could get away with crossing the street without my sight. Since my house is right there the older man pointed across the street, and Izuku followed his finger to see a beautiful blue house, small and quaint. Well, let me walk you across the rest of the way then, the child added, just to make sure you arrive safely. He then linked arms with the man. Despite the numerous amounts of bags he was carrying anyway with slow steps, they made their way across the street, Izuku making sure to match the man's shaky pace. Before reaching the curb safely the boys still kept their arms linked and led the man up the steps of his house, right to the door. Thank you. The older man stated once he reached his home, you really saved my life young man. Izuku blushed and looked away, forgetting that the man was still effectively blind it was no problem mister, I'm just glad you're okay. Are you thinking of becoming a hero? He continued. The child bounced up at that, yes sir, it's always been my dream. The man chuckled. Well, I've got full faith that you'll turn out to be someone great and if you're planning on going into heroics, then I'll just have to keep an ear out for you. Izuku grinned widely at that, beaming with pride thank you so much mister. Ishihara Tadao, he interrupted, but you can call me Ishihara. Ah, well it's nice to meet you Ishihara-san. The boy blinked, I'm Midoriya Izuku. Ishihara smiled at the boy's antics well Midoriya-san. Why don't you come over tomorrow for some tea? I really want to show you my gratitude for saving my life today. Izuku flushed again at the man's kindness he'd never been invited over before, not even by another child. Sure, does two work for you? Indeed it does. I look forward to seeing you, Midoriya-san. Ishihara walked inside his home at that. And so Izuku made his way home too it was getting dark, so he had to hurry. But, the boy did have a little bounce in his step he finally felt confident in himself and his capabilities, and having Ishihara-san's support made him feel unstoppable like he had a real shot at his dream. Gami trailed behind, having witnessed the entire escapade. He wondered why anyone had ever doubted this child. Most people didn't bother to pay any attention to a glum-looking 11-year-old as he trudged down a busy street of course. Gami was not most people he desperately tried to shake his successor out of whatever funk he was in it would not end well if he arrived at school like this. Midoriya was in a bad mood that morning normally. He did his best to start each day as cheerfully as possible, so he wasn't as crushed once he got home from school he would wake up early each morning and watch whatever episode of Mighty Adventures was playing while he sorted out his souls Gami would sit next to him, and the two of them would laugh together at Mighty Man's antics then, as they walked to Aldera Junior High. The man would ramble on about quirks or Mighty Man whatever it was. It always put Midoriya in the highest of moods and that's how it was every day. But of course, not every day went without a hitch. Midoriya knew he couldn't save every person he saw in a premonition. As much as he wanted to it was just impossible. Like how every hero couldn't save every person in need a grim reality that was hard to accept Midoriya understood it. But that didn't mean he accepted it just yet maybe he could cope with it in due time. But right now, he was a stubborn 11-year-old child who just wanted to help everyone he could. Still, understanding that harsh truth didn't prepare him for the majority of times where he couldn't save whoever he saw. That morning, the child ended up pausing on a different channel on his way to Mighty Adventures he was hoping to catch the weather for the rest of the week, just to check and see if he needed to do his laundry for more shorts what he ended up catching on the news was far worse than he expected, though not the first time it happened. It was a picture of a woman, blonde and in her 32nd, the exact same one from the boy's premonition two days earlier the reporter was explaining how she had been fatally shot in what had looked to be a mugging gone terribly wrong Midoriya had only been able to catch the fact that the police were still on the hunt for her killer before his mood completely plummeted sure. He knew he couldn't save everyone that didn't erase the fact that it put him into a cold sweat each time he failed. Izu, please Gami pleaded with the child, frantic for some kind of reaction. Midoriya snapped out of his head at that, looking down at the sidewalk while continuing to walk they were almost at the school, and the streets were starting to thin out of people. Sorry, he mumbled out, voice dry and hoarse from the silence. He could hear the figure's sigh of relief at the response Midoriya waited for him to say more, waited for the expected lecture about how he couldn't save everyone he waited for Gami to go on about how he could still help people, and that no hero was expected to save everyone he waited for what he heard every time this happened. 
and as much as he knew Gami meant it. It never helped as much as he wanted it to Midoriya closed his eyes and waited he knew it was coming and he knew it was true. But no words came Midoriya stopped out of shock Gami's sleeve came to rest on the boy's shoulder and he could feel the sharpness of the bones digging into his skin still. No words were spoken. The child reached to touch the man's hand with his own it was cold, even through the sleeve, but he didn't mind they just stood there to any person that would be watching. It would seem pretty weird that a small middle schooler had stopped abruptly in the middle of an empty sidewalk and was clutching his shoulder it would probably seem even weirder that the same child had just suddenly started smiling at what seemed to be nothing but Midoriya didn't mind. No words ever broke the silence. Midoriya ran down the school's empty hallways, cursing to himself how long had he been standing on that sidewalk for. Surely it couldn't have been that long, right? Somehow it was, as now he was racing to beat the clock. As well as the late bell the last thing he needed to hear now was his teacher scolding him on his tardiness it happened, every now and again, where the boy didn't make it into the classroom on time, but never enough to deserve the lengthy criticism his homeroom teacher liked to give he especially didn't want to have to stand there and take it in front of the rest of his class their obvious snickering always made it worse, skidding down another hallway. He saw his classroom's entry door lurching for the handle, he violently turned it and yanked the door open. The sudden noise spooked most of his classmates as they turned to see who was at the door. Only the smirk once they realized it was him his teacher's head turned too, face morphing into a scowl at the sight of his green, unruly hair. Midoriya, I hope you realize that you're late, the teacher began. The boy just stopped to catch his breath. Before pointing up at the bell it wasn't a second later that the bell rang, signaling that class had started and all students that came in after would actually be late. The teacher sighed and let his shoulders slump. Before motioning for the student to sit Midoriya grinned and walked over to his desk. Ignoring the snickers and giggles coming from his classmates he outwitted his teacher for once, and that left him in a decent enough mood to not be bothered by his peers. That was, until one of Bakugo's crew stuck his foot right into Midoriya's path. He flailed before inevitably falling face first onto the cold tile all the kids in the classroom. Regardless if they witnessed the scene or not, immediately began to laugh Midoriya pushed himself off the floor before meeting the harsh glare coming from his teacher his proud facade started to falter a bit. Midoriya, get to your seat now and stop distracting the class, he berated, before I find a reason to give you detention. The child faltered even more he never had been to detention before that kind of thing stayed on your school record. And if he wanted to have a shot at UA, he couldn't afford to start now they would already be looking for a way to deny him entry due to his quirkless status. He couldn't give them a reason due to his school record of course. He was hoping to change his quirk records before the entry exam in three years. But in case he wasn't able to, he had to have all his bases covered. Yes sir. Midoriya murmured quietly before making his way to his desk he could feel each and every glare on him as he finally sat down as the teacher continued with the lesson. He could feel the stairs slowly move off of his form one in particular hung around longer than the others he could practically feel the heat coming off of it and burning into his back he ignored it, like usual. Back Hugo was always like this after all. The rest of the classes before lunch went pretty smoothly not too much had happened since the incident in Midoriya's homeroom. And for that, he was grateful when the lunch bell rang. He waited behind as the rest of his class filed out he knew it was probably a better idea to merge with the crowd. But the boy wasn't too fond of being crowded. After years of avoiding others and lacking physical contact, he wasn't too keen on changing that on a dime as for how it got that way. It was a combination of things, the lack of affection at home, the bullying at school, the fear of his own power growing out of control. Midoriya figured it would be just easier to avoid contact in general rather than trying to fix the problem seven years too late. Still, he should have realized by now that trying to leave the room alone would only cause more problems. God Deku, Midoriya flinched at the voice, you're so pathetic can't you even walk straight? The boy would never comment on how he was tripped he was playing for the long run after all better to let them talk than try and correct them if he really wanted to outlast this nightmare so Midoriya just ignored whoever was talking and attempted to leave the room of course. He would never be lucky enough to get out that easily. Hey, who said you could leave? Another voice called out and grabbed his shoulder the boy recoiled at the touch, turning around to face whoever else was in the room it was only those two students who had spoken earlier. Luckily not Bakugo, though at this point, Midoriya wasn't sure what was worse he just stood there in silence and waited for the others to continue as they surely would. Not going to say anything Deku, the first one sneered, you really are useless. The same kid started walking towards him. A malicious glint in his eyes Midoriya looked towards the supply closet in the back of the classroom the teacher had gone in there just as class ended. And the child was sure he was just waiting out the confrontation they teachers always made it painfully obvious that they didn't care about how he was treated by the other students the man could probably hear everything that was happening. Suddenly, the kid threw a lousy punch at Midoriya's face he jumped back and ducked under the swing, before skittishly scampering out of the classroom he hurried towards the courtyard, listening to the cries behind him. 
Not too far down that same hallway Midoriya hid behind a set of open doors near the courtyard entrance. Just as the two students raced past him he stayed there for a good few minutes to catch his breath. Before making his way outside this was a natural occurrence and the boy was always prepared for those it wasn't the first time he used this same set of double doors to hide behind. He finally reached the courtyard of Aldera Junior High. And to his relief, it was empty like always none of the other students really enjoyed eating away from the refreshing, air-conditioned sanctuary of the cafeteria. Especially on hot days like today this made the courtyard the perfect place to get away from it all. At least, for a half hour he could talk to Gami here and sort souls in peace, it was like a win-win. Midoriya casually walked towards the tree in the center of the yard it was arguably the most beautiful part of the school the way it thrivingly grew in a place so toxic really helped him believe that he would be able to thrive too. Cheering him on like a silent fan its branches were tall and thick, like powerful arms holding the world up, and its leaves stayed a calming shade of evergreen despite the awful heat it even had a knot right in the center, which Gami had told him held a family of cardinals a few generations back how the man knew that, Midoriya had no idea. Now, the knot held the child's personal belongings, such as his occasional jacket for the colder days and his packed lunch he stopped using his assigned locker after multiple defacings and vandalism incidents, as well as the numerous times it had been broken into most of the time. Nothing too important had been stolen, except for the one time he had foolishly stored his winter coat in it that coat had taken him a while to save up for, and losing it had left him awfully depressed after that experience. Midoriya started using the tree knot to hold his items. Knowing it would be far safer than his actual locker the knot was deep enough that if any students had actually looked inside, they would be unable to see his stuff the only way to confirm that something was in there was to reach inside. And most of the kids at his school weren't brave enough to do that. He reached inside and pulled out his lunch bag. The same one he had been using for years he sat down against the trusty tree and began to eat, doing his job as well Gami and the boy ended up rambling on about something unrelated to the prior event, which Midoriya was thankful for the man seemed to know just when he needed a distraction. The rest of the day had gone pretty well Midoriya managed to weave into the crowd when coming back from lunch so he wasn't cornered again and nothing too eventful had happened in the rest of his classes. It wasn't until the end of the day that things got messy. The dismissal bell rang in again. The child let the rest of the class leave before eventually leaving himself he was on his way to the courtyard when one of the windows caught his eye he turned towards it and realized it showed the courtyard as well as a perfect view of the tree that stood in the center near the tree. Also stood Bekugo and a group of maybe five others luckily. They weren't snooping in the knot, but they seemed to be just standing around like they were waiting then it clicked. They were waiting for him. He turned to run in the opposite direction, as he was sure they would leave after long enough but as he did, the boy was positive he saw a head lurch in his direction praying they didn't spot him. Midoriya ran up the first flight of stairs. A stampede of footsteps behind him confirmed his worst fear. He raced down one of the hallways, listening as Bakugo's loud voice commanded the others to split up and corner him he skidded down another hallway. The stairs to the third floor inside his signature red sneakers squeaked loudly against the polished tile. Alerting everyone of his location he almost reached the door to the second flight of stairs when one of the bullies jumped out in front of him from another hall. Midoriya dove under his outspread arms and rammed the door where the stairwell hid behind he scrambled on all fours up the stairs, desperately trying to regain his balance. He went up the stairs. The kid who tried to catch him bellowed. Midoriya frantically tried to think of a new place to hide he immediately ruled out anywhere on the third floor. As some kids would likely be waiting for him there he considered the fourth floor, but decided against it for that same reason but what else was there? The child gasped the roof. The janitors were supposed to lock it once school ended. But they rarely ever did their job Midoriya would just have to bank on the fact that it would be open. Otherwise, he'd be trapped in a dead end with six feral kids hellbent on kicking his ass. He picked up his pace and dashed further up the stairs he could hear the shocked cries of the kids on the third and fourth floors as he passed them completely good. He'd made the right choice now he had extra time to figure out what exactly he was going to do once he got to the roof after all. It's not like he could really go anywhere else after that. Midoriya collided with the rooftop door and gave it a desperate push to his outstanding relief. It swung open effortlessly, and he almost fell right onto the ground he could hear the voices coming up faster now he stumbled but recovered fast enough to look around there wasn't anywhere to hide he was trapped. The voices had reached the roof where he was so had the footsteps. He turned around in a panic and watched as five kids that liked to hang around Bakugo emerged from the stairwell they snickered at his panicked form and started to approach him Midoriya began to back away as they did, but eventually ran into the railing that lined the rooftop he looked back in shock, and two of the approaching kids quickly ran to his sides to seize his arms the boy thrashed wildly at the touch. His mind spiraling in absolute agony he hated this the touches released something feral in his head he hated being touched, especially out of his control they needed to stop Midoriya couldn't think. His mind was spinning let me go let me go let me go let me go let me. A sudden sock to the face snapped him out of it. 
He could feel the warm BLD trickle down his face he didn't think his nose was broken. But the thick trail of red was really starting to make him doubt it. The kid that had punched him laughed and then gave him another sock to the gut. Midoriya gasped at that. Choking on his own spit the force of the blow knocked his head back and sent a few specks of BLD flying off his face. His head lurched forward again and hung limply on his neck. The last two kids stayed by the rooftop door, watching everything play out then. A last set of loud and harsh footsteps made their way up the stairs. Midoriya lifted his head up to meet Bakugo's stare. His eyes fluttering and desperately trying to stay open he yanked frantically on the two kids holding his arms, not sure if it was because of the touch or just to escape the current situation. But they didn't budge Bakugo walked closer, shoving the kid that punched Midoriya out of the way the other two kids followed close behind. Deku, he growled. The boy grimaced at the name, but kept eye contact with Bakugo Kakin please, I haven't even done anything today. The angry blonde scowled some more you think you're all that, don't you? What are you even talking about? The grip around his arms tightened painfully, and Midoriya yelped. Watch it, Deku. One of the boys holding his arms said. Bakugo stepped even closer, until he was right at the child's face but even then, the timid boy never broke eye contact, and that really pissed Bakugo off what was he trying for. It's not like Deku could accomplish anything significant being quirkless, so why was he trying so hard? The blonde grinded his teeth, desperate to get some sort of reaction out of the child in front of him he slapped his hand onto Midoriya's right shoulder and lit it up in a fiery rage he could see the sparks leaking out from underneath his hand, now staining Midoriya's uniform. That did it the boy's eyes tore away from Bakugo's own and unrestrained terror the blonde had noticed that Midoriya seemed to have some sort of weak spot at his right shoulder. Though he could never figure out what it was but he was finally getting the reaction he wanted he wanted Deku to know exactly where his place was. Midoriya howled at the spark on his shoulder it reminded him so much of his father too much he was barely keeping it together. The memories from that night spilling into the current moment he could feel the tears threatening to breach his eyes. But did his best to hold them and he couldn't cry now he couldn't give them the satisfaction of knowing that they won. Then, Bakugo's hand lifted off after what seemed like forever he could feel himself calm down at that, not realizing he had been thrashing crazily before, and that the two other students behind the blonde had to step in to keep him restrained he opened his eyes to look at his former friend, but found no sympathy on his face, only hate. Midoriya could feel a hand in his hair, but recognized its cold feeling as gummies he tended to forget the man was there in situations similar to this he tried to focus his mind on the way he softly ruffled his green locks, just as if the man was trying to tell him it would be okay that it would be over soon. Bakugo kneed him in the gut violently. At that, the boy lunged over weakly, and the four kids holding his arms suddenly let go he fell right to the floor face first as he had done earlier only this time. He didn't have the strength to hoist himself up he stayed limp on the rooftop, barely able to lift his head to see Bakugo and the other five students make their way to the door the kids stopped, clearly waiting for the blonde to lead them, but he also stopped at the doorway he turned around to look at the prone Midori. Remember your place Deku. He stated, something he never failed to remind the boy, a quirkless loser like yourself can't ever be a hero. And with those parting words, all of them left the rooftop. Midoriya pushed himself to his knees and slowly made his way to the railing where he had been cornered just before the railing wasn't too high, only reaching to about his waist. But the bars holding it up were spread pretty widely apart the boy slipped his legs through the spaces so they dangled off the edge he would have climbed over the railing to sit on the thin ledge that separated safety and falling to his doom. But there wasn't enough room Gami did the same. His robe flowing in the high wind they sat there in silence for a bit, before the child broke it with a sob. The sobs grew louder and heavier until Midoriya could hardly breathe he was crying so profusely that the sounds just stopped coming out he brought his gloved hands to his mouth and simply kept them there, trying to drown out sobs that couldn't be heard. I don't understand were the first words to be spoken through the sobs. Though they were muddy and almost inaudible why do they hate me so much? He could feel Gami's hand move from his head to his back. Rubbing circles into it the man didn't say anything though, opting to let the child continue ranting. I can't do this anymore why can't I be free? Why can't this just be over? The boy let his head rest against the railing, staring down four floors to the ground it would be so easy, fast, painless but it would never work his role as death made sure of that. He had tried in the past, his thoughts going back to that moment Gami had been trying to tell him something, but he was so desperate for release, he didn't listen he ran into the bathroom and opened the medicine cabinet, downing as many things as he could find after a few minutes. He was convinced he simply hadn't taken enough things. But then, Gami introduced him to another ability he had as death Midoriya viewed it as more of a curse. He remembered Gami telling him when he first got his powers that each death was required to work for a minimum of a century now he knew how they enforced it. To put it simply, he had a mortality he couldn't die. No matter how much he craved it he could still get hurt and burned and scarred. But he couldn't die Gami had told him it was so death could work without any distraction. 
but Midoriya figured it was just a way to keep each death stuck in this invisible contract so they really couldn't get out of their duties it was cruel, and he hated it. Of course, after finding that out, he desperately didn't want to believe it so he tried a few more times in a few different ways, but none of them ever worked he remained stuck in this hellish nightmare. The boy snapped back into reality at the cold touch of the man's hand on his own he didn't break eye contact with the ground though. I never thought I wanted much in life but, he started, not really knowing where his head was going with this. Gami turned to look at him, his hand still unmoving. My whole life, I guess the few things I've wanted I can't have. Midoriya moved to look down at his gloved hand. I guess I can add this to the list. But at those words, the child could feel soft sleeves wrap around him. It took him a second to figure out who was hugging him. Despite Gami being the only other person on the roof he hadn't been hugged in such a long time, it felt alien. He slowly wrapped his own arms around the man. Unsure if he was doing it right the two of them stayed like that for a bit, just silently reassuring themselves that they still had each other, if no one else. Izu, you and I both know you are going to become the greatest hero, and nothing will ever stop you, Gami finally said, breaking the quietness, not them, not the world, and surely not this. Midoriya stayed quiet at that, but the man could hear the tiniest of sniffles coming from where the boy's head was perched in his robe he smiled, though it went unnoticed, and hugged tighter. His successor was going to take the world by storm one day. Midoriya stumbled down the school's fire escape in a hurry he didn't think he could take the stairwell back down he had taken too long on the roof, and if the janitors caught him still in school after hours, it wasn't going to end well so he opted for sliding down the rusty fire escape after all. It was much safer than just jumping off the roof and waiting for his bones to heal in the morning. See, concerning his immortality, Midoriya has learned an important aspect about it much earlier in the past the immortality didn't give him any regeneration factor, but healed any injuries that could prove detrimental to his job after an overnight's rest handy. But not too practical in the midst of a fight so yes, while he could jump four stories off the roof of his junior high and be alright, he'd also be a pile of broken bones and mush until the morning. As for why he was in a rush, well Gami had the decency to remind him that he was supposed to be at Ishihara's for tea in ten minutes ever since saving the man from his unsightly demise. He would be invited over for tea and snacks around one or two times a week he enjoyed Ishihara's company as the two of them loved to chat about just anything. Kind of like him and Gami plus there were times where Ishihara would pull out his old chessboard. And while the older man would usually win, Midoriya loved it nonetheless. The boy learned a lot about Ishihara during their tea chats. The man apparently had a super neat tracking quirk he got to name under the radar. It allowed him to place undetectable, irremovable trackers on up to three items at once, even people it didn't have a size or a range limit. And the trackers couldn't be removed unless Ishihara himself released them all in all. Midoriya thought his quirk was absolutely amazing. The only downside to it was the man would go randomly blind at times, which led to the incident that caused the two to meet. But now wasn't the time for the child to be gushing about the man's quirk. He sprinted down the busy sidewalk, ignoring angry protests of commuters he bumped into along the way turning a corner. He now had the quaint, blue house in sight the boy didn't have a watch or a phone, so he had no idea whether he was late or not. Hopefully he wasn't though Midoriya really didn't want Ishihara to start asking questions. He ran up the stairs and rang the doorbell after a few seconds. The door clicked and opened up. Oh Midoriya, you made it right in time. The man's voice echoed from behind the wood. The child let out a sigh of relief he'd made it in time he looked up to meet Ishihara's eyes. Oh my goodness, what happened to your face? Midoriya reaches a gloved hand to touch at his face in confusion he pulled it back only to find a decent amount of red staining it right. His nose he'd assumed it had stopped bleeding by now. Guess it hadn't. The older man ushered him inside and shut the door behind his smaller form the boy was pretty dazed during it all, but remembered Ishihara seating him on one of the dining room chairs and cleaning up his face the man then got up to throw away the BLDY tissue before getting a new one. It was the kids at school, wasn't it? He spoke softly it seemed like a lot of people were doing that today. Midoriya didn't say anything back, but the way he looked away from Ishihara's concerned stare gave the man all the answers he needed. Midoriya, I know you don't like talking about it, but can you at least tell me why they're hurting you? The child's brows furrowed at that sure he had known Ishihara for a good three years. But even then, how would he react to knowing the boy's biggest secret? Well, I guess it wasn't his biggest per se, but definitely the most detrimental would those three years of friendship go completely down the drain. Midoriya didn't want to risk that, ever. He looked back up at the man's eyes, and immediately regretted it staring into those eyes full of concern made his heart swell with guilt the lump in his throat grew larger, and the boy was afraid he would start crying again but it was either that or talk and Midoriya refused to do the latter. So the tears fell down his face silently, and Ishihara moved quickly to wipe them away before they mixed with the BLD from his nose but even that wasn't enough for his conscience apparently. I am quirkless, he sputtered out what was he doing. He tried to stop, but his mouth didn't listen be but I still want to be a H-hero and save P-people. Ishihara listened silently as he continued, 
The other K kids at school know and they D don't like it that's when his mouth gave out on him and he went back to crying there it was it was out he waited for Ishihara to reject him like everyone else did he would never get to enjoy tea and snack or talk or play chess with him again it was over. Oh Midoriya and for a second time that day. He felt arms wrap around him I'm so sorry you have to go through that. He looked over to the man in shock, you're not mad. Then it was Ishihara's turn to look shocked. Why would I be mad? It's just cause, he murmured. Most people are when they find out. Well then, I guess I'm not most people, the older man reassured. Besides, you've already saved my life you're a whole step ahead of those other kids. The child's face changed to one of confusion. You really don't care that I'm quirkless. Ishihara smiled. I meant what I said when we first met Quirk or not. You are going to be a great hero one day Midori. And that finally broke the dam as the boy bawled his eyes out but with Ishihara at one side and Gami at the other, they were more tears of happiness than anything else. Midoriya fiddled on the couch while Ishihara handed him a plate of chocolate chip. Cookies covered in plastic wrap the man was nice, enough to package away some of the spare treats he prepared. The two had enjoyed tea and those same chocolate chip cookies earlier after the man cleaned up the child's face, and Ishihara even whipped out his old chessboard of course, the older man still won the game. But the boy didn't really mind Ishihara really did a good job of lifting his mood from the depressing mess it began as but as all things, it came to an end when a small alarm by the living room TV rang. Oh well, six already. Ishihara sighed and looked at the small boy worryingly. You can stay a bit longer if you'd like. Midoriya shook his head vigorously. No no, I'll be alright. He pushed himself off the couch, still feeling pain where he was punched earlier back Hugo's follow-up attack didn't exactly help either he hadn't found the time to check the area yet, but guessed a decently sized bruise now dressed it he landed roughly on his feet, stumbling slightly, but catching himself on the armrest of the couch Ishihara looked at him in concern, but the child flashed one of his signature bright smiles in reassurance the man passed him the wrapped plate of cookies that Midoriya put on the couch so he could get up, don't worry about bringing the plate back, the older man said, I've got plenty. The boy took the treats from Ishihara and held them close to his chest. Afraid he'd drop them the second he left the house today had been a roller coaster of events as well as emotions he still hadn't gotten his hands to stop sweating or his knees to stop shaking but he wasn't hyperventilating anymore and his heartbeat wasn't drowning out the rest of the world. So the child still considered it a win. During Midoriya's internal reflection, he had made his way to the front door, which Ishihara held open for him. Thank you for everything Ishihara-san, he whispered out, just loud enough for the man to hear. It really means a lot to have your support. The older man smiled at that. Just make sure to remember your biggest fan when you go pro. Midoriya giggled Gami may end up giving the man a run for his money, but Ishihara didn't need to know about that. The boy trotted down the front steps and started down the sidewalk. Clutching his plate of cookies tightly Gami followed behind, quiet as ever. See you Thursday. Ishihara called out from the doorway hopefully, after school. The child turned to look back, before displaying another heartwarming smile, sure thing. See you then. Midoriya continued towards his house as he heard the wooden door click shut Kami moved up to walk next to him, but didn't say anything he looked at the man in confusion. But the silence remained he shrugged it off and went back to gazing at the plate of cookies Ishihara really knew how to bake, and the boy was grateful that the man shared it with him he could count maybe ten. No twelve cookies under the plastic wrap oh he couldn't wait to eat another one once he arrived back home. Izu, the child looked back at Gami expectantly, but continued to walk when the man seemed to hesitate. He motioned for him to keep going. Do you remember what I said about being around to teach you the basics of your job? Midoriya nodded, still not being able to put the pieces together, and that I would finally be off to rest once you could handle yourself. Once the man finished, it finally clicked for the boy no no no, not after all they'd been through together not after today his heart couldn't take it sure, the child had Ishihara, but that was only a couple times a week if Gami left, he'd really be alone his hands were shaking profusely now and his grip on the plate slipped. But Midoriya didn't even care he waited for the loud crash of the ceramic against the concrete sidewalk and hoped the noise would shake him out of his head, but no sound came. He craned his neck to look down, expecting to see the plate shattered and the cookies spread out on the ground but instead turned to see Gami knelt down. The plate lay in his hand, completely intact. He rose back up and outstretched his arm to hand the plate back. Izu please, the man whispered, just listen. Midoriya took the plate back teary-eyed they threatened to fall again for the third time that day but he nodded nonetheless and waited for him to continue he would hear his friend out Gami deserved that at the very least, what I said was true. Even if it was all those years ago, he kept listening, despite the growing lump in his throat, and after these seven years together, I know you are more than capable of handling yourself in this position. It was growing harder and harder to listen the boy stopped walking, having to put all his focus on not bursting into tears. By those words I said so long ago, I should be ready to move on and finally enjoy peace after all these centuries. But, the man paused, and Midoriya could hear him take an audible breath he still dared not to look at him in fear of breaking down. 
I have grown to enjoy your company Izu. And now, though I am technically dead, I have never felt more alive. Kami seemed to stumble over his words. And the child finally gained the courage to look his friend in the eyes or at least, where he presumed his eyes would be it was impossible to see any of the man's face under that dark hood of his. I believe what I am attempting to convey is that I care for you, and I am not ready to move on just yet. Midoriya's eyes widened, and a few tears slipped from his grasp. You are more than just my successor, you are my friend, and I wish to be around as you grow. I wish to watch you spill your cereal each morning, and hopefully change your breakfast tastes to be more than just mighty smacks. I wish to watch hero cartoons together when we get back in time to catch them. I wish to have more conversations that seep into the late night about quirks or heroes or whatever had plagued the day. I wish to support you as you continue fighting for your dream. The man fiddled with his long sleeves, picking at them from the inside with his bony fingers he hadn't imagined this conversation to be as hard as it currently was he broke eye contact with the boy standing in front of him, not like anyone could tell. I want to be there when you become the greatest hero Japan has ever seen. Kami lifted his head up at the first few sniffles, but was completely unprepared when his successor embraced him in a crushing hug, the plate of cookies on the sidewalk he hadn't heard them break, so the child must have placed them down. You really mean that? Midoriya whimpered out. Eyes puffy, cheeks red, face utterly soaked in salty tears. I don't want you to stay if that makes you unhappy. You're my friend Gami. I just want you to be happy. The man did make out what the boy was trying to say, though it was nearly inaudible due to his guttural sobs and hoarse voice. I meant every word. Gami couldn't recognize the voice that just spoke. It was so full of emotion was he crying. He truly had no idea I want to stay. It was quiet. Except for Midoriya's sobs they merely stood in the center of the empty sidewalk embracing a plate of plastic-wrapped cookies at their feet if any person was watching. It would seem pretty weird that a small middle schooler had stopped abruptly in the middle of an empty sidewalk with a plate of cookies on the ground near his feet. It would probably seem even weirder that the same child was currently hugging himself while crying loudly but Midoriya didn't mind. He didn't mind at all. Get back. Midoriya rushed over to the crowd of curious bystanders, watching in awe as a giant, rampaging villain tore apart a shopping district. The 14-year-old looked back quickly to check on his friend who was weaving between people despite being able to pass through them. The boy tried his best to push through the crowd as politely as he could, finally reaching the front pro hero backdraft, was doing his best to manage the mass of civilians with his water hose quirk. Keeping them distanced from the fight, Midoriya stretched behind him to grab at his worn backpack, not taking his eyes off the fight as he pulled out a notebook and pencil without even looking his eyes flashed at the hero fighting. Kamui Woods, before flipping to a specific page and jotting feverishly, Wow, it's the popular young star Kamui Woods. The teen exclaimed, I can't believe I managed to catch him in action. Haha, ha, a running commentary huh? A bystander with three pointed star looking shapes extruding from his head chuckled, Are you a fanboy? Midoriya shifted in embarrassment, becoming a bit uncomfortable as he realized how close he was to the rest of the crowd but at Gami's sudden touch to his shoulder, he relaxed more and went back to writing. Aram no, he tried to explain. I just really enjoy taking notes on quirks he then started murmuring quietly about the hero's quirk. Arbor the quirk was a transformation class, but very flexible and beneficial in most situations. Midoriya speculated how the hero could apply his branches binding capabilities in situations other than capture then. As Kamui Woods bent down, he realized the hero was about to perform his signature move. Take him down, tree man. The bystander from before yelled. Here it comes, it's his preemptive binding Midoriya cried. Lacquered chain prison. Kamui finished, shooting off his branches as he extended his arms towards the massive villain. The villain roared in shock and flinched back at the enormous amount of branches plowing towards him. Canyon Cannon. A giant woman, larger than even the villain, suddenly appeared out of nowhere and kicked the villain right in the jaw. Midoriya gasped, startled by the new hero's sudden appearance, before snapping right back into action. Flipping to a new page and writing out notes of the new quirk cameras behind the two flashed as they tried to snap a picture of the new female hero Gami shuddered in annoyance and moved to stand at the boy's side rather than behind him. Today's my debut, the lady shouted as she shrunk back to normal size, but not before shaking her rear, pleased to meet you all. You can call me Mount Lady. The now-proclaimed Mount Lady moved to stand next to the restrained villain and waved towards the largest crowd of cameras she flashed a wide smile as a single cameraman from the group came up to her to get some close-up shots of the new hero and villain Kamui Woods remained on the perch he was just fighting on, crouched and dejected at his spotlight being stolen. Wow, gigantification huh? Midoriya muttered under his breath as he scribbled into his notebook. It's a common and quite powerful quirk. But could the threat of public property destruction limit its use? Maybe if. Well it would depend on whether or not she can manipulate her size at will, Gami added after staying quiet for most of the fight. Ah yes yes, the teen whispered even quieter than before he didn't want to seem like a crazy person at responding to seemingly nothing. Taking notes huh? The man with the protruding shapes asked. 
Not noticing the boy's last response, I guess you wanna be a hero yourself, good luck. Midoriya perked up at that compliment. His eyes lighting up Gami shifted to put his arm in front of his successor his eyes opposingly narrowed compared to his friend. Even though no one could see it under his hood, much less actually see him in general no one normally praised the boy. So the ghost was quite weary when it happened, especially since the other children at Alder would pretend to compliment him only to see the dejected look on his face once they took it back but his successor seemed to take the praise well. So the man backed off a bit. Thank you. He responded happily. I'll try my best. I hate to interrupt Izu, Gami interjected, but we are going to be late if you stay any longer. Oh you're right, he exclaimed. Forgetting that no one else could hear the man standing near him the bystander gave him a strange look. But Midoriya didn't notice he scrambled back through the crowd, ignoring the shudders that rushed through him each time he bumped someone's arm. He really didn't enjoy crowds, but the rush of watching a fight was too much to resist sometimes besides. Once he heard on the news that Kamui Woods was fighting, he was all too eager to remember his fear of contact. He had been very interested in the young hero's quirk, especially his signature move. And while he did look up as much information as possible, nothing could compete with seeing it in action and while he certainly wasn't expecting to see the debut of a promising new hero, Midoriya was extremely glad he had decided to bear the mass of bystanders in the end. Running down another busy street, he pondered the new hero to keep his mind off the fact that the sidewalks were much too crowded for his liking her giant Identification quirk was certainly a marvel to see in person, not something video feed could really do justice. But he hadn't noticed any support gear on her costume the teen guessed that the costume itself had to be made of an extremely elastic material for her to shrink back to normal without any problems. But that was pretty much all he noticed and yes, he considered that the new mount lady was going for a more destructive style. And that kind of fighting didn't really permit much support gear, especially with a gigantification quirk but for him. That didn't negate the benefits that support gear brought he could think of many different items that could work with her changing size. Such as an elastic rope or whip that stretched and shrunk with her that kind of weapon would be easy to make and allow the hero to make more precise attacks without worrying about damaging public property plus if there was ever a situation where she couldn't fit between buildings, the whip would allow her to still contribute to the fight. Of course, there was always the notion that her costume was made of purely skin tight elastic simply to boost her ratings with the male population that was the trap many female pro heroes fell into whether they knew it or not most costume designers were male after all and you couldn't deny that they may have slipped some personal ideas into their work shirt some female pros did use this fact to their advantage like Yuobami, the snake hero who was also a television celebrity her charming looks as well as her celebrity status often made working with police and rescuing civilians easier but Midoriya hoped that heroes were more modest than that. After all, for him it was more about saving people than popularity. The seductive pose that Mount Lady flashed for the cameras pretty much dashed any ideas of modesty for the new hero for goodness sake. Even the nice bystander who complimented him had been drooling at the sight. Midoriya pushed forward he could see his middle school now if he kept at this pace. He was sure he wouldn't be late keeping his current pace wouldn't be so hard though. The boy's nightly endurance runs made sure of that plus. Constantly running from Bakugo and his group helped out even more as long as he left school early. They never managed to catch up to him of course. His endless stamina didn't really help when the bullies cornered him during the school day. But it was still helpful overall. But right now, as long as he didn't bump into any of the solo pedestrians, he would make it on time he wasn't going to be late. That put a small smile on his face. You guys are all third years now. Midoriya's homeroom teacher called out. The boy had arrived at school five minutes early. Much to the displeasure of the other students the teacher hadn't been in the classroom, so Midoriya was able to slink in without hearing any berating. Despite the fact that he wasn't late the day had gone pretty smoothly, with the teen managing to avoid Bakugo and the others at spots where they normally cornered him. Like on his way to the courtyard he was in a cheerful mood and was hoping to end the day with it this last class of the day wasn't too bad either. The teacher was trying to go over plans for the future. It's time to start thinking seriously about your futures. The teacher continued, grabbing a stack of papers lying on his desk Midoriya knew exactly where he wanted to go with his future. But he also knew that his classmates, even the school itself, didn't support him he didn't want to attract any unnecessary attention to himself though, so the boy sank into his chair in an attempt to make himself smaller. He was still writing in the notebook from earlier him and Gami had been talking about the fight at lunch and the man brought up some great points concerning the new hero, as well as the teen explaining his ideas for potential support gear Gami hadn't been able to finish his thoughts before the bell rang. So the man was talking to the boy now. Despite the fact that the teacher was also talking Midoriya wasn't too concerned with whatever the teacher was rambling on about now. Taking the time to scribble each idea the spirit was giving him this was one of the times he was thankful that no one else could hear Gami, even though it was pretty awkward when the teen responded to him out loud and someone else heard. 
I would hand out these future career forms but he shook the stack of paper he had picked up in the air he then slammed both his hands onto the face of his desk, along with the papers, startling Midoriya out of his personal conversation thankfully. The boy didn't make any significant noise or catch anyone's attention, but now was focused on what exactly the teacher was doing. I assume you all want to be heroes. The teacher exclaimed and swung his hand back towards the chalkboard, scattering the career forms everywhere his class cheered out and all started showing off their quirks Midoriya like looking at his peers' quirks. He thought each one was unique and could be used for hero work in their own way Gami too. Stopped talking and looked around at the variety of quirks being shown he wasn't as impressed as his successor however, having seen quirks similar to these over his centuries of work. At first, he was surprised that Bakugo didn't join in on the fun and glanced over to see the blonde looking smug with his feet on his desk he was going to do something brash, Midoriya just knew it. Yes yes, you all have wonderful quirks, the man sighed, trying to get his class to calm down, but you know that it's against the rules to use them at school. The teen glanced over to look at Gami, who was now standing beside his desk rather than behind him as he usually stood the man seemed to be staring right at Bakugo however. Almost taking a defensive stance the boy turned to follow Gami's stare the blonde was now grinning widely compared to his small smirk before oh now he knew Kakin was going to do something. Sensei, the angry blonde yelled, don't lump me in with these losers. The class showed up at that, as if I had anything like their awful quirks. He sneered and leaned back into his chair. The class erupted into chaos again. Midoriya and the spirit watched as the students booed and shouted, desperate to prove themselves and heal their damaged pride they reminded the small teen of a pack of hyenas trying to jump a lion. Bakugo then bursted into laughter, shut up extras, ah yes Bakugo, you of course, the teacher announced over the loud wailing of his students, must be aiming for UA high school. The room grew even louder, comments flying overhead like runaway kites Midoriya shrunk further into his seat he was sure the teacher knew he was also aiming for UA and hoped that the man didn't use that information to embarrass him. As easy as it would be Gami stepped closer to his successor's desk, fearing something bad to come and ready to offer support. I aced the mock exam. The blonde continued, jumping up out of his chair and landing on top of his desk. I'm the only one here with the stuff for UA. The boy would never comment that he also aced the mock exam the class wouldn't care about that. Only the fact that a quirkless kid was trying to get into the best hero school in the country besides. He had gotten all the praise he needed from Gami and Ishihara concerning the mock exam. I'll even surpass All Might and become the best hero out there. Midoriya scoffed at that. Though it was unlike him leave it to Kakin to challenge the number one pro hero in all of Japan. Not to mention I'll be one of the richest people in the world. At that, Midoriya and Gami rolled their eyes. Though one was completely invisible both went unnoticed however. Bakugo's yelling and the chaos of the rest of the class thoroughly took the attention off of them and that's just how the teen preferred it he really didn't want all of his peers' eyes on him. Especially when it would end up being more than just eyes. Aren't you also going for UA Midoriya? The teacher's words swept over the room like a plague. Bakugo stopped shouting immediately, standing atop his desk completely still, as if someone had broken him the smile on his face fell almost instantly. The class had gone completely silent. All turning to look at him in shock their stares burned into him like hot coal. Gami pushed his hand onto his successor's desk. Eyes leering at the rest of the people in the room he wished he was alive in that one moment. Just so he could trample across the room and smack the smirk right of the teacher's face. And throw every single desk that got in his way no one messed with his successor, his friend no one. Midoriya wanted to curl up and die in that moment he could see his teacher's smug grin. Just as if he wanted this to happen his hand started shaking underneath his desk. But he faced the class head on he would not give in to them today. The class exploded with laughter. All directed at him it startled the young teen. But he didn't show it he just shifted his eyes to look at his desk instead of the disapproving glares of his classmate. Back Hugo jumped from his desk suddenly. Hands starting to spark. Come on Deku. He screamed, his anger fueling his quirk, causing a decent-sized explosion to burst from his palms the blast knocked over Midoriya's desk and sent the boy flying into the back wall he let out a gasp at hitting the wall roughly and slumped down Bakugo followed the boy and scowled, while the teacher and students did absolutely nothing but watch. Forget those extras quirks. He berated, you're quirkless and you think you can rub shoulders with me. Midoriya flinched at how close Bakugo got to his limp form, w wait no, Kakin. You really think a school like UA would let a quirkless wannabe like you even try? The boy looked down at that he already knew UA wouldn't even consider him as a hero student once they saw his records read quirkless Midoriya had gone through a lot of trouble to get his official records changed just to avoid that if anyone looked into his official records. His quirk was Reaper, and it allowed him to decay things at a touch and summon aside that's it. He kept it as minimal as possible to avoid suspicion beside. His other abilities, like premonition and the soul stuff wasn't something that could be easily picked out in a fight. Midoriya didn't answer. 
and Beck Hugo was starting to get angry the students continued to stare and some of the blondes group got out of their seats and moved to stand behind him Gami stood protectively in front of the fallen boy, trying to shield him from whatever the angry teen might do. Even though no one could see him Midoriya smiled softly at his friend's actions, hoping no one saw, but he wasn't lucky enough for that. What are you smiling at Deku? Beck Hugo growled. A chorus of yes and Dekas followed suit. What can you even do? The boy looked down at the floor and he swore he heard the spirit growl back at the children surrounding them but as much as he appreciated the gesture, his mood was spoiled he could only sit there as they laughed and laughed and laughed. Struggling to hold his tears in Midoriya had always been a natural cry, but he wouldn't give them the satisfaction they wanted. Not now. Not ever. The incident promptly ended after a few moments. The bell ringing and the teacher letting the class out Midoriya lifted himself off the ground and hobbled over to his desk. Ignoring any wandering stares in his direction his phone buzzed in his back pocket and he excitedly reached to pull it out, happy it didn't break on his rough impact with the wall. Midoriya could finally say that he owned a phone after about nine months of saving up for one that was also with taking up extra jobs that neighboring communities would offer him. More than he usually did to survive he didn't mind the extra work. And Gami suggested that investing in a phone wouldn't be a bad idea the teen put off the idea of buying one for a while. As they were reasonably expensive and he didn't really need to get in contact with anyone on a daily basis. But now that he was going into high school, he figured he might need one, especially if he got into UA. Oh wow, he whispered, half to avoid the attention of his peers. Half so Gami would realize he was talking to him. The incident this morning is blowing up all over the news. Indeed I assume Mount Lady's new appearance is really taking the spotlight. Yeah, let me just grab my notebook and we can go. Midoriya smiled and reached for the thin book with a big No. 13 written on the cover in thick marker. It was the same book he had been writing in earlier this morning at the fight. It held plentiful notes on various quirks that the boy found. Interesting, he enjoyed scouring the news or the internet for heroes with marvelous quirks, occasionally picking out some underground heroes to research they had some of the most amazing powers he'd ever heard of. And he was often bummed that no one praised them as much as they deserved and true to the title, he had 12 more notebooks at home. Suddenly, the notebook was snatched from his hand Midoriya wasn't expecting the intervention and shrieked, his hand flinching back into his chest. We're not done here Deku. Bakugo snarled as the classroom emptied out, waving the notebook in the air by his thumb and pointer finger. What's that Katsuki? One of his lackeys asked with a smirk on his face. Another turned his head to read what was on the cover. For the future? Seriously? What future? See come on, Midoriya cried, lunging slightly at Bakugo's outstretched hand. Give it back. The blonde, being decently taller than the green-haired teen, easily kept the book out of his reach then. Back Hugo brought the notebook between both his hands and in a flash, lit it up Midoriya let out a loud wail at the sight of his work being exploded. Not even being able to see it through the smoke and fire the light was so blinding he had to look away for a moment to regain his focus, and glancing back, saw Gami flinching away from the light as well. The man, despite being a spirit, severely disliked bright lights the boy didn't really know if it was a personal thing or a ghost thing, but noticed it nonetheless. Now, despite that fact, Gami still adorned what the teen thought was a scowl for the first time in a while. Midoriya could clearly see the thin, bony hands that normally hid in the man's long sleeves, reaching out in a threatening manner at Bakugo. And while Gami was certainly channeling the anger he felt as well, the boy felt more despair than anything else. W.Y. He whimpered in anguish, his cries going unheard. The angry blonde spared him a slight glance, before letting out a short breath. Then tossing the burnt book out of the open window the boy let out an even louder cry, scrambling to the window in an attempt to catch it before it landed sadly. His efforts were fruitless as he watched his work land into a man-made fish pond Gami watched as his successor visibly crumbled. Still trying to hold in his waterworks the man swiped at Bakugo's head, though it just went right through the blonde. I'll be the first and only hero from this crappy middle school. He continued, as if nothing had happened, so in other words, Bakugo made his way over to Midori. The pair snickering in the background he placed his hand onto the teen's right shoulder, right where the scar from his father laid he let out a shaky breath at the contact, especially at by who and where it was he watched as the blonde's hand started to smoke, and fought off the urge to rip the hand off him he hated when Bakugo did this I hate it I hate it I hate it I hate it. Don't even try for UA, understand. Midoriya's lip quivered, his mind racing he looked up to see Gami behind the blonde. Directing him to control his breathing he followed the man, taking an unstable breath in and letting out a wobbly sigh. Then, Bakugo's hand was gone. And him and the other two kids were on their way out of the classroom the green-haired boy continued to stand still, not trusting his legs in the moment he looked down at the ground. And Gami knelt down to keep eye contact. Still instructing the boy's breathing all that could be heard was soft, staggered breathing, not a single quip back from Midoriya. Typical come on, say something one of the kids remarked. He can't say anything, the other replied. He's so lame, even as a third year he still can't face reality. Midoriya's hand tightened on one of his worn backpack straps.
Fighting between lunging at the children and dropping to the floor in agony he could see his reality he could he insisted to himself that he was gifted with something special. And the boy would use it to save lives he could he would so why did he feel like crying right now? You wanna be a hero so bad. God did Bakugo ever know when to just shut up. I got an idea for you. Midoriya thought he must have recoiled or something. Because he could hear a scoff come from the blonde as he continued though, it could have just been Bakugo amused at the thought of his coming remark. Just hope for a quirk in your next life, he declared, and go take a swan dive off the roof. Thankfully, the three of them left the classroom fairly quickly after that and didn't hear the teen fall to his knees. They didn't hear his choked sobs as he lost all progress in regaining his normal breathing. They didn't hear a loud screech against the floor as Gami lunged at them in unrestrained rage, passing through them and colliding with a desk instead. They also didn't hear a centuries-old ghost curse out the universe for his temperamental solidity. Though, nobody heard Midoriya under his breath, desperately wishing he wasn't as ungodly immortal as he was. The boy didn't stay alone in the classroom for long. As much as he wanted to he composed himself well enough to make his way to the fish pond where his notebook was. Though, the janitors wouldn't ask even if his face was blotchy he arrived at the pond, only to find a fish nibbling at the corner of his prized possession. That's not food, stupid fish, he cursed. That's my notebook. He lifted the soggy book out of the water and carefully flipped through the pages the ink was ruined. He couldn't even make out the words all of today's notes. Kamui Wood's signature move, the new Mount Lady's gigantification quirk, and the rest of the writings he had in there, gone forever he wanted to cry even more. I can still read it, Gami piped up. That is definitely not the most illegible writing I have seen in my years of work. W wait, really? Midoriya sniffled. Yes, and if we get home soon, I can translate it for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. He lunged over to hug the man tightly they stayed silent for a bit, as they usually did during one of these moments. You will prove them all wrong one day Izu. The man carefully strung his words together, don't let them get in your head. I know, the boy added quickly, but it doesn't make the words hurt any less. He wearily shook out his wet notebook. Before placing it gently into his backpack Midoriya started his way towards home, wishing he could visit Ishihara today instead of the plan tomorrow Gami didn't hesitate to follow him. Walking at his side instead of behind he could feel his successor holding onto the end of his long sleeve. Not that he minded it was something the boy usually did in states of high distress. I'm just going to keep my chin up. Midoriya spoke after a while, in a determined voice that didn't match his body language, and keep moving forward, no matter what they say. The spirit walking beside him smiled warmly at that, though no one could see. They approached what looked to be the tunnel underneath a small bridge it was dark and eerie, and gave both the boy and his mentor a dangerous vibe. Be careful Izu, something is not right here. I picked up on it too, but I will. Midoriya took a slow step inside, hands ready to defend himself after a few moments of silence. He took another, landing on a manhole cover leading to the city sewers he paused again, looking all around him for an attack. He didn't notice the sewer cover start to leak. Suddenly, a massive amount of sludge bursted from the holes in the cover, completely enveloping the boy's small form. Perfect. The sludge panted, a medium-sized Bodido hide in. The teen cried out in shock, but the sludge quickly silenced him by stuffing itself down his throat. A villain, Midoriya used his one free hand to grab at the sludge in his mouth. But it was no use the fluid was just slipping through his fingers Gami tried clawing at the villain as well. But his spiritual form proved detrimental tugging at his successor didn't help either, the boy was completely stuck. Thanks kid, the villain monologued. You're a real hero I never thought he'd show up in this. What do I do? Midoriya thought I can't breathe and I'm only getting weaker he knew that he wouldn't die. But that still left an unwanted houseguest puppeting his body he stared right into the eyes of the villain as more fluid shoved itself into his mouth wait. His eyes. The boy looked back at the faded yellow eyes hidden in the sludge the sludge may not be solid, but his eyes must be. He just had to bank on that. As bad as he felt for doing this, Midoriya shot his free hand towards one of the eyes of the villain he shoved his fingers right into them and the villain flinched, but held strong. You're not getting away that easily. He cackled. Luckily for Midoriya, that wasn't his plan. After a few seconds or so, the villain felt his eyes start to burn up surely the boy hadn't poked him too hard, right? But after another couple moments, it became more than just irritation. Ahhh my eye. He roared in pain, releasing Midoriya to cradle his wound. The teen jumped back at his newfound freedom. Not wasting his chance Gami rushed over to his successor in concern he just nodded in reply, not really being able to speak due to the just previous suffocation. The villain screamed again, I can't see. What did you do? Midoriya stopped death's touch at that point he didn't need to decay the entire eye to handicap the villain in front of him though looking back at the sludge. He realized he may have gone a bit overboard in his panic. Half of the eye was missing leaving the remaining fluid to slowly ooze into the sludge on that side of his face the villain was desperately trying to fill the new gap with his slime to stop the leaking. All while continuing to scream in pain the boy would have felt bad. 
if it weren't for the fact that the same villain was just trying to stuff himself down his throat. The boy flexed his hand, summoning a large scythe. The blade almost resembling a bird's beak as a hole near the top could be mistaken for the bird's eye Gami had told him a while back that he could summon a weapon to fight with. If need be it was mostly to keep the aesthetic, as death didn't go out and reap souls anymore, but still real and useful for slicing Midoriya hadn't had too many chances to whip it out in practice, but he found it came naturally to him. He gripped the weapon confidently with both hands, and swung it at the villain's midsection the blade cut cleanly through the sludge and flung a good portion of the goo onto the tunnel wall. Having the villain's size the villain didn't seem to be in any more pain because of it, so Midoriya figured the best way to incapacitate him would be aiming for the solid parts, which he could now see were his eyes and mouth. In a desperate attempt to retaliate, the villain lurched out a tentacle of slime at the team he flexed his hand again, and the side disappeared so he could roll roughly out of the way he quickly summoned the weapon again and slashed at the appendage that had attacked him. Slicing it clean off it splattered onto the ground like wet paint Midoriya made his next move. Of course, he didn't want to kill the villain, so in his next swing, he turned his side so the flat part of the blade was plowing towards the mouth hidden in the sludge. The sheer force that came off each swing seemed unreasonable for a boy of his stature, even if the boy was fit. But he wasn't complaining the flat blade crashed into the villain's mouth just as he intended it to, and the sludge let out one last shriek of pain before spatting into the wall right next to the other half of his body the goo oozed down and piled up on the ground, making Midori a tense. But it didn't reform the villain was out cold. Midoriya had won he had single-handedly stopped a villain. As much as he wanted to, he couldn't celebrate now who knew when the villain was going to wake up, so the boy threw his backpack to the ground and opened it up, searching for something to contain the sludge in a water bottle or something but alas, he had nothing freaking out a bit and still on his high of adrenaline, the teen wondered what to do. Hey Izu, I think you can use this, Gami yelled as he pointed towards two empty plastic liter bottles lying on top of an overflowing trash bin. Yeah, I think that might work. His successor cried as he ran over to the basket ignoring the awful stench that came from the pile. Midoriya grabbed the bottles that lay on top sprinting back over to the prone villain. He started scooping up the goo and shoving it into one of the bottles. Much like how the villain tried to force his way into his own body Midoriya didn't mean to. But the irony of the moment made him smirk he pushed past the uncomfortable feeling of the wet sludge at his fingertips and kept shoveling it into the container the boy was about halfway there when a sudden noise came from the other end of the tunnel he readied himself for another villain, maybe the sludge man's accomplice, and leaned his hand in preparation to summon his sigh. I am here. All Might had been trailing the sludge villain since an incident this morning. The man still in his casual clothes and carrying a bag of groceries his chase had led the hero to the underpass, but he unfortunately had to stop for medical reasons and hadn't gotten the chance to confront the villain jumping down. Now completely buff, the man was ready to pummel some sludge. He certainly hadn't expected to see a small middle school teenager on his knees staring right back at him, scooping the villain's sludge into a large bottle with his offhand. Oh hello citizen, the man was unsure of what to say. Midoriya made no move at the sight of the number one hero. Not even the slightest reaction Gami looked over to the boy, figuring he must be in shock then, as he expected, his successor exploded. Oh my goodness, the teen exclaimed, not bothering to get off his knees or stop collecting slime, all might. Ah yes, that is me, the hero replied awkwardly, turning the conversation elsewhere and finally speaking at a normal volume, did you take out this villain by yourself? At that, Midoriya shuffled, looking bashful, all while he attacked me on my way from school I just did what I had to do. All Might didn't respond right away, instead taking a moment to observe the situation in front of him there was still sludge on the wall and ground, as well as in the boy's hands the bottle the teen was holding was nearly filled with sludge, and the hero winced slightly at the sight of the student trying to force one of the villain's eyes into the mouth of the bottle. Here, let me assist you civilian. The man cried as he lowered himself and picked up the second empty bottle. Ah, tea thank you All Might. The two spent a few minutes cleaning up the gooey mess, with Gami watching comically in the background Midoriya finished much faster than the hero, since he had started well before All Might arrived. So he capped the bottle tightly and left it near the man before making his way towards his backpack lying on the ground he opened up the worn zipper and scoured through it. The teen searched for something for his idol to sign, but all he really had of worth was his ruined notebook sighing in discontent. He pulled out that item and closed the bag, slinging it over his shoulder out of the corner of his eye. He saw the spirit, who had been watching in the background, finally approach him Midoriya smiled as he felt Gami give him a sincere pat on the back, a silent good job hung in the air. The boy snapped back to attention at the sight of All Might rising, now with both filled bottles in his hand. Oh you All Might, he stuttered out, hoping to catch the hero before he left. I was hoping you could sign this for me. The pro turned to face the young man who had so valiantly taken down this troublesome villain, a large smile adorning his face, of course. He put the bottles in his cargo pant pockets before reaching into his back pocket, pulling out a black pen. 
and signing his name on one of the blank pages of the damaged notebook. You know, young man, the hero started. You did an excellent job in taking down such a potentially dangerous villain. Ah uh -uh, really? Midoriya stammered in shock and all his idol was praising him. It was like a dream come true. Indeed, All Might shouted. Before returning to a more reasonable volume, you will most definitely make a great hero one day. The teen almost cried at those words all of the negative comments from across the years dissolved at his idol's praise he could see Gami shift uncomfortably, weary of the praise. But his successor dismissed him with a slight wave of his hand. The hero handed the signed notebook back to the teen. Before moving to escape the underpass he really needed to leave, he could feel his body start to give out on him he wouldn't be able to hold his form for much longer. Now I must bring this villain to the authorities, so I must be heading off. No, All Might couldn't leave just yet sure, Midoriya had gotten his praise, but he needed to know he needed to know the answer to the question that had plagued his life for 14 years. Hold on, the boy cried, I need to ask you something. I really must go young man. The hero insisted, bending down to prepare for launching off he needed to leave now. Please, at school, I get picked on. The pro hero froze at that. Midoriya knew that picked on was definitely an understatement but he took the silence as a cue to keep going. I want to be a hero I think saving people is the most amazing thing someone can do the teen shuffled nervously. Opting to look at his feet rather than at his idol he didn't notice the man starting to smoke. Crap, I need to wrap this up quickly, the seasoned hero thought. E but I don't exactly have a quirk. All Might swung his head back at the young boy at that last comment. Now listen young man, I get hurt all the time during my hero work he made a scuffling noise, which brought Midoriya's attention up off the floor the man lifted up his shirt, revealing a large wound that resembled a spider web the boy shuddered at the sight of the gruesome injury. Gami didn't like where this was headed and put his hand onto his successor's shoulder where it comfortably sat he squeezed it lightly, trying to tell his friend that they should leave. The team didn't notice. Five years ago an enemy did this to me. The smoking hero said relatively quickly. My respiratory system was nearly destroyed and my stomach had to be removed. I can only do hero work for about three hours a day now. W wait. Wasn't that with the fight with Toxic Chainsaw? The hero chuckled uncomfortably. Well, you know your stuff. But no it was another villain I asked that this was never made public. I'm sure you can understand why. All Might paused for a moment. Before feeling for the bottles in his pockets the smoking was getting even worse now he couldn't stay for much longer. Look kid, he stated bluntly, losing the respectable young man. I'm the number one hero and I still got hurt without a quirk. You don't stand a chance. Both Gami and Midoriya tensed at that. For different reasons the spirit tugged again on the boy's shoulder, but he didn't move the teen just stood there, wide-eyed with shock. E but I the boy stammered. Trying to explain since the hero cut him off earlier he wanted to tell the man about his abilities despite his lack of a quirk maybe he should have started with that. If you want to help people, the hero interrupted again, oblivious to the situation in front of him, becoming a police officer isn't a bad option sure, they're often mocked but it is admirable work but a hero. It's just not possible without a quirk. All Might turned away from the student in front of him, crouching down for a second time. It's not wrong to dream, he continued, however, you need to be realistic. And with that last comment, the hero launched himself off the ground, his buff, smoking form becoming nothing more than a shrinking sight in the sky. Midoriya just stood and watched as his idol flew off into the day, completely silent as the shock of the situation finally set and it was so quiet. Gami almost didn't notice the fat tears that streamed down the boy's face, the drops splashing against the paved ground as heavily as they came down. There was still no sound. That was, until the teen's knees buckled and he lost all strength in his legs. Gami reacted quickly, scooping up his successor underneath his arms the teen just hung limply in the spirit's arms, barely registering the feeling of his soft sleeves in his hands as he clutched them for dear life his tears still ran down his cheek, and the ghost could feel them soak into his sleeves. But he just continued to cradle the distraught child the silence was finally broken by sobs and pained breaths as the boy brought his hands up from the sleeves around him to cover his face. The two of them simply stayed right in that spot, Midoriya's burnt notebook lying face up on the ground. Teasing them with the sight of All Might's signature the boy didn't dare look down at it the thought alone pulled at his heart. He wished he had taken a different way home. He wished he had left when Gami had tried to pull him away. He wished he had continued to live in ignorant bliss of his idol. Never meet your heroes, because they're sure to disappoint you. As All Might flew high across the sky, his thoughts were still heavily grounded on the green-haired boy beneath the underpass had he been a bit too hard on the teen. The hero suspected that might have been the case, though he couldn't recall any changes to the boy's mood. But the issue of accidentally revealing his casual form was too much of a pressing matter for him to idle he supposed that a single broken dream was a fair price to pay to keep his secret under wraps. Still, as the wind tangled with his hair, the pro could feel a small drop of BLD escape his mouth even through his clenched smile. Damn, all might cursed, I need to land now. 
The man rolled roughly onto an open roof of what he assumed to be a standard office building the fencing surrounding the ledge wasn't too high or covering, but the building itself was tall enough that he was sure no one could see him the smoke started plowing off his body not seconds later. All mixed with his sigh of relief all might hope that no one mistook the heavy exhaust for a fire and alerted the police he really didn't want any more close calls today. As the last of the smoke rolled, the hero could feel his muscles relax that's usually how he could tell he had reverted back to his Deba form. Besides the obvious smoke of course it surprisingly felt nice to release his hero form he often compared it to holding in his gut at the pool sure it looked good, but it was uncomfortable to hold for long periods of time. All Might slumped down against the railing, shoulders slouching as the man let himself go in the moment his hand brushed against his side wound on its way to his forehead, and stopped there instead he clutched his shirt feeling the fabric gather in his fist, all while pressing his knuckles against the scar the ugly wound haunted him every day. Even when the hero didn't directly touch it every time he felt the smoke seep off of him or strain to hold his buff form, he had to resist the urge to curse out his greatest enemy for doing him dirty. He eventually let go of his shirt and brought his hand up to his forehead as he intended his mind kept wandering to the young student from under the bridge the boy said he took out the villain on his own. Despite his claim of not having a quirk, but the hero was just having a hard time believing it the villain was definitely sneaky and certainly a slippery foe to apprehend. He even gave the pro himself a run for his money considering his unstable hold of his hero form so the man just couldn't fathom how a quirkless teen of such a small stature managed to subdue the sludge villain it simply puzzled him maybe he'd take a look at the unconscious villain in the bottles for a better clue. He reached down for the bottles in his cargo pockets, only to find himself patting down empty fabric confusion flashed onto All Might's face for a split second before utter panic took over he stood up quickly, patting himself down. But only feeling the black pen in his back pocket he had signed the boy's notebook with his head lurched on his neck, searching the roof around him for any sign of the bottles or the villain. But he found nothing the bottles must have fallen out when he was worrying about holding his form while soaring over the public eye had he really been so preoccupied with keeping his secret that he had lost the villain in the process. How had he, all might for goodness sake, made such a rookie mistake? The frail man hurried over to the roof door and made his way down the staircase as fast as he could and even if he did find the bottles. What if the villain had managed to escape? Who knew what damage the villain could cause after escaping his grasp or how many innocent civilians would be put into danger because of him he could feel his throat run dry at the thought, his eyes being completely overshadowed by his guilt. And yet, all his mind could do was leech back to the boy who had supposedly captured the villain alone regardless of if he had actually done it or not. He told the boy he couldn't become a hero, and All Might was not about to let a quirkless teenager show him up when it came to doing his job. Back Hugo and the two other students that had stayed behind with him to talk with Deku. Now walked casually down an empty alleyway the blonde could smell the others smoking. Behind him and clenched his fist angrily those extras were going to cost him his perfect record for UA didn't those dumbasses ever learn. Hey Katsuki, one of the kids called from behind him, haven't you known Deku since you were kids? Yeah, the other chimed in, still with the cigarette in his mouth, don't you think you might have got a bit far today? Back Hugo scoffed, kicking a soda bottle violently with his foot he could hear the cap pop off as it hit the wall it's his own fault for messing with me. He crushed his own soda can with a small explosion before chucking it into the trash, seeing him so full of stupid dreams like when we were kids just pisses me off. He could hear his lackeys gasp in shock from behind him, but could still tell that they both had cigarettes in their mouths. I thought I told you to stop smoking. The angry teen yelled, startling the two he turned around to face them in his full rage. If you get caught it'll be on my record too. He could see the frightened faces of those extras like he enjoyed. But they didn't seem to be exactly frightened of him or even paying attention to him and that pissed off the blonde they both just seemed to be in shock. With their shaky fingers pointed at Bakugo the one kid with a long finger quirk had his finger elongated and misshapen unconsciously. Like he had no control over his power, Bakugo scowled these losers were angry at him for claiming that he'd be the only kid from Aldera to get into Yue. And yet they'd dare challenge him with such awful control over their quirks these extras really made his own quirk bubble with fury. H. Hey. The long finger kid cried were those losers still gawking at him. They both took a step back in fear. And that was enough for Bakugo to realize that they weren't gasping at him no they were afraid of something behind him. The teen whipped his head around to look, but he wasn't fast enough all he managed to catch was a wide, unhinged mouth lunging to swallow him whole. A body with a good quirk was all the boy heard before succumbing to his pure, unfiltered adrenaline. The next time Bakugo could remember thinking clearly, all he could see was fire the buildings around him were destroyed and fire and rubble covered the alleyway the teen could feel his quirk going haywire, lighting up his sludge-covered hands to think he was just harping on the rest of those idiots for their non-existent quirk control he could hear someone screaming furiously amidst the raging flames and chaos. It took him a minute to figure out that the screaming was his own. He could barely breathe with the sludge wrapped around his face, 
the villain's giant set of teeth covering his own the villain was trying to force his way down Bakugo's throat, and the kid was way too prideful to let that happen, even with a fight. G-A-A-H-H-H, he cried. Fighting desperately against the muck the blonde could feel the buckets of sweat pour down his face, figuring out that the overload of perspiration must be causing his quirk to go nuts as if I'd let this mudman take my body for himself. Despite the chaos, the villain was reveling at the sheer power this kid had what strength. I've hit the jackpot. With this quirk and this much power, I can finally have my revenge on him. Bakugo felt the nasty set of large teeth curl into a hideous smile what was this lunatic even thinking about? His eyes darted around the scene, but his vision was too hazy for him to see much blackness dotted his sight near the corners and he wasn't sure if it was from his panicked adrenaline or the strain he was undoubtedly putting on his worn body he tried to focus on his surroundings. But the fire just engulfed everything buildings, signs, banners, everything was just in flames was that because of his quirk? Did his explosive power really cause the massive destruction he was seeing? He tried to turn off his quirk, but his endless sweat and anger just fueled the fire. Literally he felt awfully helpless in the moment as he struggled against the sludge, but the villain's cackling dampered out his fight. He jutted out his head as he felt more goo wrap around his face. His angry scowl still stuck upon his cheeks his eyes bounced around again. Trying to take in a new angle of his surroundings he saw something fuzzy lying on the broken pavement, but wasn't sure if it was actually something or just another blurry spot but as his vision cleared, he gagged. Though it could have been due to the stuff down his throat he would have thrown up if it weren't for the invasive sludge flooding his mouth. The blurry spot was a man, lying unconscious on the fiery pavement his head was propped up by a broken piece of rubble. His mouth wide open and eyes clenched in pain the blonde couldn't tell if the civilian was breathing. But he certainly wasn't moving oh god, had his quirk done this. He couldn't live with himself if that man died because of him. Where were the heroes? Said heroes were. Scrambling. To handle the situation. Mount Lady stood by the alley entrance, leaning over a crowd of civilians being blocked off by police she reached out a single foot over the bystanders, holding onto some buildings for support. But the street was simply too narrow there was no way that she would be able to fit between the buildings she could hear the shutters of camera flashes from underneath her over the roaring flames and screens, and it was starting to annoy her. A single lane street. My only weakness. She cried out. Someone else needs to handle this. Kamui Woods weaved through the debris and dodged pillars of fire that erupted from the broken concrete he was considerably slowed down by the two squirming middle schoolers his branches had picked up. But that was his job he dropped them off by the entrance where the police picked them up and stopped to take a breather. He could see the fight with the sludge villain and the kid he had trapped even from behind the crowd but the heat had taken its toll on his quirk. As his branches were much thinner and more fragile than usual if he even got near the center of the fight. He was sure he would be too useless to help the civilian's dangerous explosion quirk was really causing problems. Explosive fires are my weakness. Kamui yelled over the chaos. Someone else has to take this one. The hero let out another sigh the kid would just have to wait a bit longer until someone with a better quirk came to help. Backdraft could hear Kamui's cry. But the hero was currently fighting the raging fire that consumed the alleyway the firefighters hadn't arrived yet. So right now he was the only one keeping the flames from spreading uncontrollably he knew how crucial his water hose quirk was to the situation, so he really couldn't just abandon his post. The heat from the fire was severely drying the hero out though he was regretting his costume design in the moment. The many layers of thick fabric was not only making him hot, but weighing him down as well Backdraft resisted the urge to jump away from the flames and rip off his helmet he was starting to taste the thick smoke through his mouth guard and felt the sweat run down every inch of his skin he wasn't sure how much longer he could last before he would have to leave for a safer spot, much less be of help to the sludge villain fight or the hostage situation. I've got my hands full. Where are these firefighters? He bellowed. How's it looking over there? Death Arms grimaced, his sidekicks right beside him scouring for civilians he had tried attacking the sludge villain. But his massive fist simply sank into the goo he needed one of his sidekicks to help yank his arm out, but retreated after that failed attempt he tried regrouping with the heroes present, but only Kamui Woods was really available, and even then, Death Arms wasn't sure his quirk would be of much help. He's too slippery to get a hold of, and the hostage with the explosion quirk is resisting. The hero called back to backdraft, it's like a minefield out here. We can't do anything against him. Suddenly, every hero was brought out of their thoughts by an anguished yell everyone, including the bystanders, turned to look at the blonde teen being held hostage by the sludge but only death arms, Kamui Woods, and a few psychics could see the winced expression on the boy's face as he tried to fight back one of his arms, which was covered in the goo, was attempting to move closer to his face but the sludge was pulling it in another direction none of the heroes noticed the strain on that specific limb, until the blonde's strength gave out and the slime came crashing towards the heroes. Look out, 
A sidekick yelled and the heroes all jumped back to safety Death Arms raised his hands to his face to block the debris that flew into the air at the strike when the smoke cleared and the appendage moved, the group paled at the sight. A large crater now decorated the ground where the villain attacked it had to be at least a foot deep and was charred black from the scorching of the civilian's explosion quirk he noticed a few of his psychics shudder at the realization of what would be their condition if they had been hit. And honestly the pro didn't blame them the villain was plenty strong on his own. But with the teen's quirk practically at his disposal, it made the situation a lot more difficult. It's no good. There's no one here who can stop him. Death Arms yelled. Watching the sludge reform after the attack, we have to wait for someone with the right quirk to show up. He gestured behind him for Kamui and his sidekicks to retreat. Until then, keep the damage to a minimum, Backdraft replied. Witnessing his glove melt due to the heat, someone will come eventually. We just need that kid to hold on a bit longer. One of the sidekicks cried. Death Arms clenched his fist if only I had the strength to blow that villain away. All Might rushed over to the crowd only to find his worst fears confirmed the sludge villain he once had in his pockets was now causing chaos in that alleyway. And holding a kid hostage the seasoned pro wheezed and wiped the sweat of his breath. His hair still tumbling around from his run he must have lost the bottles in his rush to get away from the underpass and dropped them as he was soaring but how had the caps come off? He was sure he had forced them on tight before he left had they simply popped off from the impact with the ground. Or was it something else? Regardless, the hero searched his body for any drop of stamina he could use to transform, but found nothing had he seriously been this poor with his time management and already used up his three hours. His scar throbbed in agony, and the man nearly doubled over his hand shot from his forehead to clutch at it through his shirt. He looked out from behind the crowd it was ironic. The number one hero in all of the country forced to watch helplessly as a villain he had just held in two soda bottles was holding a child hostage it made him sick to think that the teen in the midst of this mess would likely not come out alive if a hero didn't come soon. And still, his mind kept coming back to the green-haired boy whose dreams he had crushed how much of a hypocrite would that boy think he was if he could see the hero now. Pathetic he really was pathetic. Midoriya trudged down with his ruined notebook in his hands, his eyes just as empty. As the street was, which was on the streets, were normally packed at this time. But it wasn't like he was complaining Gami was saying something. But the boy really couldn't make out what it was over his mind's own turmoil. It's time to start seriously thinking about your futures. Midoriya was sure of his future up until today and now, he was really starting to doubt if he could ever do anything worthwhile in his life. Despite being immortal what would he even do if he wasn't going to be a hero? He really hadn't thought in that direction was he really that blinded by his dreams? What would his future even amount to? Would it even be worth anything to try? He still can't face reality. The teen was well aware of the twisted reality he lived in where the powerful were praised and the weak dejected quirkless individuals were placed at the very bottom of the hierarchy. Worse than even villains themselves Gami would always coach him through these situations, telling him that he could make a difference that he could be a hero he had the ability, the skill, and the intelligence to be a far better hero than most students trying to be one but society would never let him get that far he was hoping that going to high school would leave him with a fresh start. But he wasn't expecting much was it him that couldn't face reality or society itself. He really didn't know at this point. You need to be realistic. He was being realistic, right? He had abilities sure they weren't quirk related, but that shouldn't matter. He could do things that humans before quirks couldn't that had to amount to something it was realistic that a kid with powers could be a hero he was just like any other kid that dreamed of being a hero so why did those words sting so much? Was it because they were from All Might himself? Was it because not even the number one hero believed in him? The man had shut down so fast once the quirkless part was spoken how realistic could he be if no one would give him a chance? I-Z-U-K-U. G-I-H-H. The boy yelled, startling out of his head and dropping the notebook onto the pavement he looked back at the spirit, who was now silent he leaned down to pick up the book, but something else fell instead then something else then another thing it took him a moment to figure out they were his own tears he sniffled and rubbed at his nose, trying his hardest not to cry any more than he already had. Izuku. He felt so bad at the tears running down his cheeks it had taken Gami so long to coax the boy out of the underpass, and even longer for the tears to stop it was like all of the spirit's efforts from over the years were unraveling he really didn't mean to disappoint his mentor, his friend. But that's all that he ever felt he was doing Midoriya didn't even realize he'd stopped walking or that Gami was now kneeling in front of him the boy was now mumbling under his breath. Even the best of the best said it, he sobbed incoherently, this is my reality. No, Midoriya blinked in confusion no. This is not your reality. Gami continued in the silence. This is their reality Bakugo's reality Aldera's reality even All Might's reality this is how they view the system and they are trying to force it onto you. The teen couldn't deny that he found truth in the ghost's words but his mind held onto this bad habit of spiraling deeper and deeper into his own darkness it had been like this for years Gami's support just barely lifted him out of the pit of despair he fell into each day but he couldn't go on like this forever. They do not like what you represent. 
What, what could a useless, quirkless kid like him ever represent failure? Worthlessness, surely nothing good. You represent change. Izuku you are a quirkless child attempting to be a pro hero your existence alone is threatening everything they stand for. Wow, he hadn't realized he'd been messing things up so much. You are change, and they are afraid of that they want you to simply stay quiet and live how they believe you should they want to discourage you from breaking the mold. Simply because that is what they are used to that is their reality but it is most certainly not yours. They were afraid of him, that didn't seem right after all. He was quirkless what could he even do? You are your own person. Izuku, regardless of if you have a quirk or not you cannot stop them from trying to force their beliefs onto you. But you do not have to listen you are capable of doing anything you set your focus on. Despite what they try to tell you and if you want to be a hero, then you can. You are not bound by anyone's rules, because you are not underneath anyone that is your reality. His own person. What did that even mean? He'd been hearing the same things all his life, from his mother, his classmates, his hero. And now Gami was telling him that they didn't matter he was so confused and so used to just being yanked around by everyone he was supposed to be below the villains. That's just where he belonged. Enough. It felt like his head just exploded. Like he'd been hit right to the temple with Kakin's quirk he grabbed at his ears and wailed. Dropping to the ground right next to his book he could feel his mind trying to spiral down again like he was used to. But the teen wouldn't let it this time he was done listening to them. Done needing their validation Gami was right. He didn't need to be bound by anyone to feel accepted. He was done letting them break him. D did I say something wrong? Oh yeah. He still hadn't said a word in response the spirit was probably a bit freaked out that he'd been crying again for the third time today. Oh, oh no, you've P probably said the most R right I've ever heard. He watched the man tilt his head in confusion maybe he should elaborate. I've been relying on others' opinions my whole life I've been worrying about making my mother like me again. About proving to my classmates that they're wrong. Even needing the validation of All Might simply to give me the motivation to keep going but I need to stop worrying about them I need to live for myself. Gami nodded. I believe you are correct I am sorry for making you believe that you needed to prove them wrong to be happy. No, Midoriya cried, before realizing his outburst and continuing. You don't need to be sorry you've supported me for so long and even helped me understand where I'm going wrong if anything. I thank you for sticking with me all these years. The spirit didn't respond, but ruffled the boy's hair. His way of acknowledging that he was listening he watched his successor pick himself up off the ground, both literally and figuratively. As well as his notebook the teen brushed off his uniform and swung his bag off his shoulder, before opening it up to put the book away now with his hands free. He confidently held his backpack straps with a small smile. How about we go get some ice cream, Izuku? We always pass by that one stand on our way back home. Midoriya wiped his eyes before sniffling again that was the fifth time Gami had called him by his actual name the boy wasn't really used to it. Yeah, that sounds nice. Midoriya and Gami arrived at the ice cream stand, but to their dismay, it was closed actually. Closed was an understatement the shop was practically boarded up and abandoned. Like the owner just fled that didn't make too much sense. The shop was open and running yesterday, and he didn't remember seeing any signs that said they'd be closed today it was a pretty weird mystery. But not one Midoriya spent too much time contemplating he had already cheered up on the way to the stand, and didn't really need the sweet treat anymore. They had just begun walking away from it before the teen almost collapsed to the ground. This wasn't an unfamiliar situation, and it actually had nothing to do with the previous breakdown the boy had a few minutes ago. Kami immediately flung into action, slamming his hands down onto the boy's shoulders and squeezing them tightly Midoriya winced in discomfort, but acknowledged it as his anchor his way to remind himself that the coming premonition was just that, completely separate from reality. His head spiraled similarly to how it usually did when he lost control of his thoughts, but it wasn't exactly the same every time he had a premonition. He could hear a sort of buzzing in the back of his mind. Nothing too crazy though the teen watched as his view of the boarded up ice cream store morphed into something else entirely. The first thing he noticed was a mass of light blonde hair it wasn't anything that stood out. But he filed it away for further analysis he was having a hard time clearly seeing the person in this premonition. Almost like they were covered in something as they died he was sure it wasn't water, as he had visions before of people drowning and he could see them just fine. The second thing he picked out was the suffocating feeling of being well suffocated it was so hard to breathe. Like he had something stuck in his throat did this person choke to death. Midoriya wasn't sure, but it didn't feel like this person was choking on food or an object it was a weird feeling, seemingly choking on air, but then the boy realized exactly what it was. This person was choking on sludge. It was the exact same feeling he felt when the sludge was forced down his throat oh my god, did this person go through the same thing? He wouldn't wish this even on Bakugo for goodness sake. The third thing he saw were the eyes of the individual he was surprised that they were so clear compared to the rest of the person they were wide open in fear and Midoriya could see the bright red pupils shrink in contrast to the rest of the eye. Those eyes seemed so familiar those bright, bright red eyes. Oh my god, those were Kakin's eyes. The sludge villain was trying to take over Kakin's body. 
and he succeeded. Midoriya was yanked out of his head at that realization, grounding his vulnerable consciousness to Gami's squeezing of his shoulders the ice cream stand was now in front of him again, and the spirit was going through his normal process of calming the teen down after the foresight, but his mind was going a mile a minute. Oh my god, Kakin died he stuttered out in disbelief, and it was by the same villain I just fought. The ghost froze. The villain escaped all might let the villain escape. The boy felt his phone go off in his back pocket, but was too stunned to even react Gami shook him violently. Izuku, Izuku, that's a news update. The spirit exclaimed. Midoriya ignored the fact that Gami had referred to him by his real name again and whipped out his phone the local news was blowing up over a villain attack a few shopping districts down an alleyway was on fire and looked like a war zone but when the boy saw that familiar green sludge, he felt his heart stop this wasn't possible his foresights couldn't come true this soon. And yet, he took off running towards the district. He hoped so badly that he would be wrong. He skipped to a stop at the first sight of a crowd of an attack gained news traction. He was sure there would be a group of bystanders to follow he pushed his way through, ignoring angry protests of the people he shoved a bit too hard. Why are the heroes just standing there? He heard a voice call out. I heard the villain grabbed a middle schooler. Someone else responded. Midoriya's quaking hands clasped over his mouth. No, no, no it couldn't be true it had to be someone else. He had his vision only a few minutes ago this wasn't supposed to happen. Hey, isn't that the villain All Might was chasing earlier? Another voice piped up. Then the crowd devolved into talk about All Might sure. The boy had left the pro with the villain restrained. But obviously the villain was free now, so where was All Might? I can only do hero work for about three hours a day now. Oh no had All Might exhausted his time limit. Was that why he wasn't here yet? He finally reached the front of the crowd, and only a line of sparse policemen separated the civilians from the fight in front of him. There was fire practically everywhere and rubble covered the pavement so thickly he couldn't even see the sidewalk anymore. He could pick out pro-heroes to arms and Kamui Wood standing next to the police. Why weren't they trying to fight the swirling slime that morphed and grew in the center of the alleyway? The slime had grown much larger and thicker than what had originally attacked the teen beneath the underpass he could tell someone was struggling underneath all that goo, but couldn't see if it was Kakin or not his mind flashed back to the feeling of when he was being suffocated by the slime the feeling of being alone and helpless as this villain tried to take over his body practically invaded Midoriya as violently as the sludge had. He could see explosions come from the sludge. He tried to convince himself that some other middle schooler could also have an explosion quirk. He could see blonde hair peek out from the sludge. He tried to convince himself that some other middle schooler could also have an explosion quirk in blonde hair. He could see wide, red eyes turned to stare fearfully at the crowd from the sludge. Red eyes, red eyes, red eyes, red eyes. Midoriya couldn't convince himself anymore. He raced out towards the villain, completely ignoring the cries of the police and the heroes from the sidelines. He didn't even notice All Might watch him in shock from the same crowd he was just in. Nor Gami's cry for him to wait as he passed through the crowd, literally. Death Arms and Kamui Woods gasped in complete horror, but didn't say anything right away. A million things ran through Midoriya's head. How could his premonition come true so soon? He would have to press Gami about it later. Where was All Might? This villain was supposed to be his responsibility, so where was the pro hero? Why weren't the other heroes doing anything? They were just standing there, doing absolutely nothing they were just watching Kakin die. But the teen didn't focus on any of the spiraling thoughts going through his mind he wouldn't freeze up now, especially while he was running towards the villain that had tried to steal his body earlier. Get back here you fool. He could hear death arms howl, but paid no attention to the hero, stop. Midoriya expertly dodged the debris all over the ground, but kept a steady pace towards the chaos his eyes darted to each pile of rubble, looking for something to defend himself for when he got to the villain he really didn't want to use his sigh. But if it came down to it, he would do anything to spare Kakin of the fate he'd been forced to watch. The sludge turned in his direction, eyes bulging out when he realized who was running at him. You. The slime screamed, I quote hell I'll kill you. Bakugo followed the villain's gaze only to see a blurry figure with a mop of green hair running towards him as that Deku. But Midoriya ignored it all, his pressing thoughts, the screams of the useless heroes from behind him. Even the threats from the villain in front of him he passed a relatively large pile of debris and noticed something long and shiny sticking out he stopped for the quickest moment to pull out the object, only to feel it break in two looking down at his hand for a slight second. He realized he had a piece of a sign pole, the broken edge sharp like a spear. This would just have to work. Flinging his backpack onto the ground. The boy grasped the makeshift spear in his right hand he kept running at the villain there were only a few more feet separating the two. You're dead for what you did to me. The villain roared. Akigo could only watch a helpless victim in it all. Midoriya stepped down firmly on his left foot and raised his hand holding the pole right over his head he only had one shot. This had to be perfect he didn't focus on any of the distractions not the raging of the villain or the cries of the heroes or the roars of the flames he cleared his mind of everything except for one thing a single thought that echoed over and over and over in his head. I will save people. 
The pole flew out of his hand with speed that could rival Ingenium it sailed into the air as everyone watched with stunned breaths even the villain himself watched, watched right as it sank into the eye that the boy had decayed earlier. The scream that left those enormous set of teeth stained the ears of everyone who watched. The green-haired teen didn't stop though the attack had given him his only opportunity to save back Hugo he sidestepped and met the blonde's terrified eyes with his own the sludge had recoiled just enough to reveal the teen's hand. And Midoriya didn't think twice before grabbing it with both of his. With all of his strength, he tugged as hard as he could he was afraid that his strength alone wouldn't be enough to free his bully from the goo he was afraid that he would end up needing Gami's help and that the man wouldn't be able to reach them in time. But his fears were quelled as Bakugo came flying out of the slime. The two boys tumbled down onto the rough pavement. But Midoriya didn't waste a second he got up on his feet and yanked Bakugo up with him he shoved the blonde back as a large hand of slime plowed towards him but he wasn't going to let himself get caught again the boy jumped back as the limb crashed down. Debris flying everywhere he picked up one of the smaller pieces of concrete that had been sent airborne and chucked it right at the villain's mouth it nailed him right in the teeth. Stop getting in my way. The villain cried and unhinged his jaw, ready to swallow the teen whole. The hero standing on the sidelines suddenly dashed towards the two boys. Does he have a death wish or something? Death arms bellowed. Midoriya almost laughed at that, but managed to dodge the first chomp the villain made at him. Bakugo could only watch in shock from the ground, still trying to catch his breath. In the crowd's panic, All Might still watched from the back in his debuff form. He was pathetic. He really was pathetic. The boy whose dream he crushed, who had been on his mind all day, was now risking his life to save the hostage and he, the number one hero, could only watch the sight alone filled him with the urge to step in. But it wasn't until the feeling of uselessness set in that he really got the power to fight. The green-haired teen was worried he couldn't dodge forever. But the only way to switch to the offensive would be to reveal his scythe and he really didn't want to do that. Not only could he get into big trouble with the law for using his quirk illegally, but the boy could only imagine how Kakin would react. Suddenly, a large hand grabbed his arm and pulled Midoriya away from the fight he could only see the two signature tufts of blonde hair. But that's all the teen needed to recognize who it was. The lesson I left you with. All Might spoke loudly over the chaos, I should practice what I preach. The hero lifted his right fist back behind him as the crowd went wild at his sight. A pro should always be ready to risk his life. Blood spewed from his smile, though no one could tell amidst all the other things happening at the same time. Detroit Smash. The pure force coming off the punch sent a shockwave in every direction the other heroes just barely managed to stay anchored to the ground the bystanders simply stood in shock, just as if time itself had stopped. A single drop of rain nailed Midoriya in the head, and he lifted his head up to the clouds then another, and another, and another, and another everyone, even the heroes, looked around in confusion as rain started to pour down from the heavens. No way the boy mumbled. He changed the air pressure with that punch. As the rain came down harder, it quenched out the fire that Backdraft had been battling vigorously. Cheers came from the civilians and reporters watching. All Might had beaten the villain and changed the weather with a single punch. The fight was finally over, and Kakin was alive. All Might had left the scene just as quickly as he arrived, leaving the rest of the heroes to pick up the villain's scattered body. M. Idoria and Bakugo sat by the entrance to the alleyway, a team of paramedics scrambling to check them for injuries. Thankfully, none had anything more than some minor scratches, but the medics made a thorough search just in case. The news reporters had been roped off away from the middle schoolers, so they couldn't get any statements from the two boys but they kept their cameras rolling on the kids. What were you thinking? Death Arms lectured. But Midoriya didn't bother to pay much attention the heroes had berated him nonstop since All Might left and the teen could partially understand why he had run right into a villain fight. Of course the pros thought it was foolish they obviously didn't know that he was immortal, but that was a given they thought he was just a normal civilian child who had almost gotten himself killed. He didn't have to turn around to realize that Gami was now standing behind him the spirit had a sort of air around him that gave his presence away to the boy it made the teen feel much calmer. Knowing his friend was right behind him he had lost focus of the man's whereabouts in all the chaos. But even still, he had managed to save the blonde, subduing the villain long enough to pull him out of the sludge but none of the heroes even commented on that. Much less praised him he wasn't asking to be praised. But all the heroes seemed to remember him doing was run idiotically into the fight and nothing else. Bakugo, on the other hand, got plenty of praise they admired him for his powerful quirk and simply fueled his ego not a single hero commented on how his so-called powerful quirk had restricted them from actually helping him or stopping the villain or that his quirk had caused the majority of the damage to the district in the first place. Midori appealed when he realized that Gami had been right all along society was definitely a hierarchy Bakugo was at the top, and he was at the bottom. At one point, Midori phased back into reality long enough to realize Bakugo was yelling at him. You stupid, quirkless Daku. No, 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 not that infectious word. What? You're quirkless. The heroes practically yelled luckily. The boy didn't think the reporters had caught the comments they had started lecturing him again, turning away from praising the blonde. 
How could you even think about running in like that when you can't do anything? One of the heroes yelled Midoriya wasn't sure which one it was, but he wasn't about to let them berate him for being quirkless he had already heard enough before the toxic word entered the fray he wasn't going to just sit and take it like he would have in the past. The teen stood up, startling the heroes and the cameras on him the heroes tried to get him to sit back down so they could continue yelling at him. But the boy wouldn't let them he fought the urge to call the heroes out on their bullshit right then and there, not caring if the cameras caught his words but Midoriya had enough for today. And honestly, the boy was pretty much done with the world at the moment so he turned to exit the alleyway in silence, ignoring the words from behind him. Then, death arms grabbed him by his right shoulder. Dami could feel the air temperature drop by at least 10 degrees. Don't you dare touch me. The green-haired teen growled and ripped off the hero's hand he was so close to going off on the man, but considering that the reporters might have caught his first comment already, he reluctantly bit his tongue he left the scene without saying any more than that, despite the other heroes still trying to make him stay. Bakugo could only watch in shock. Did Deku just growl at a hero of all people? What the actual fuck was going on? Midoriya escaped the wave of reporters that tried to corner him after he left without much difficulty he shuffled home on an empty suburban street, his mood a complete hurricane he wasn't sure what to think honestly. Gami's voice broke the silence. I am really proud of you, Izu what you did today, while it did terrify me, was very brave. He looked up at the spirit, unsure of how to react. You think so? You saved the life of your bully, and did it quite well if I must say. Most wouldn't understand why the boy had chosen to save his childhood bully, but to Midoriya, it made perfect sense. I just did what any real hero would do he put a bit more emphasis on the real part of his statement Gami seemed to understand exactly what he was trying to say. Both were pretty angry at the heroes on the scene they simply stood on the sidelines and watched as Bakugo struggled for his life. Each and every one of them they apparently felt as if they didn't have the right quirks for the job, so instead of trying to improvise, trying to do something, they just stood there ready to sacrifice the life of a child because their plan is didn't work and there was no argument that could ever convince the green-haired boy that Bakugo would have survived without his intervention no argument could ever persuade him that a hero would have arrived if he had simply waited. After all, he had watched the blonde suffocate to death just minutes before in his own head. Speaking of that, Midoriya did ask the spirit what was up with his premonition today, but not even he could explain it Gami had insisted that he never had a vision come to pass until at least an hour after viewing it. So the premonition even surprised him the best the ghost could do was suggest that maybe the foresight was supposed to happen earlier, but got pushed back due to his emotional breakdown the explanation was shaky at best. But it was also the best either of them had the teen hoped that for someone else's sake, this premonition incident never happened again. Hey Deku, Bakugo yelled, running down the street and startling the boy out of his thoughts he really didn't want to deal with the blonde right now. He turned to face his bully it looked like he was shaking with rage, his fists clenched at his sides. I never asked you to save me. He called out with a scowl on his face, I could have beaten him myself. The angry teen's eye twitched Midoriya made no effort to reply, letting the blonde continue as he indubitably would. How dare a quirkless failure like you pity me trying to win me over. Don't you dare mock me. After that, Bakugo spun around and stormed off while grumbling under his breath neither Gami nor Midoriya made a move to stop him whispers in the back of the teen's mind kept insisting that he was right that he should focus on a more realistic future. But the boy was done listening to that part of his conscience today was a turning point for him he didn't need Bakugo to accept him or his dream he never did. It felt good to finally realize that. But just when he thought the day was done giving him surprises, it threw one last curve a ball at him. I am here. Midoriya flinched at the voice and the spirit whipped around protectively, but the boy dismissed him Gami relaxed but stayed on guard as the pro hero flew out from one of the empty alleyways. All Might, why are you here? He wondered, wouldn't you have been surrounded by reporters? They were everywhere. The hero struck a comical pose, shaking them off is nothing to me. After all, I'm all am I. The man couldn't keep up his form and slumped over, losing his muscles instantly blood spewed from his mouth the teen looked around in confusion, unsure of what to make of the man's other form. W what just happened? All Might nearly slapped himself that's right, he'd forgotten that this child didn't know about his true form. Remember how I said that I could only work 3 hours a day? Yeah, but, well this is how I looked the other 21 hours. The boy just blinked I guess this explained how the man wasn't caught in public more often. Look kid, he tried to get back on track, I've come to thank you and revise what I said earlier I also have a proposal. Midoriya just blinked again his tired brain was struggling to take this all in. Without watching you in action, I would have been just another helpless bystander in that mess, so thank you. The teen took a second to process what the hero just told him helpless bystander did that mean All Might was in the crowd. That the hero watched too as Bakugo was dying. Of all the people at that scene, it was only you, timid and quirkless you, who acted. You spurred me to action. There it was again that awful, toxic word that society had stained him with why did it keep coming back? 
Most of the top heroes show greatness even as children many claim that their bodies moved before they could think. The boy could hear how hyped the man was getting and it just made him more and more uncomfortable Gami was definitely feeling the same thing. But neither of them moved they really hadn't learned their lesson from beneath the underpass. That's what happened to you back there, yes. Not really what spurred the child to action wasn't some unknown force that simply pushed him along no not at all. What made him act was knowing that Bakugo would die if he didn't intervene that Bakugo would die a painful, agonizing death by the villain who would have stayed successfully detained if it wasn't for All Might that Bakugo would die at the hands of such a monster. While no one did anything to try and save him, Bakugo would have died. All Might mistook the boy's silence as confirmation. Well, I'm here to tell you that with my power, you can be a hero. Midoriya didn't make a single sound or move a single muscle. What? What did this man think he was saying? Could he even hear the words coming out of his own mouth? I know, the teen finally replied. The seasoned hero did a double take. What? I already realized that I can be a hero, Midoriya continued, and I don't need anyone else's approval. Kaomi was about to jump the man for a second time, but decided to let his successor finish first. He was glad his friend finally decided to grow a backbone. Plus it was pretty entertaining to watch. But without my power, without a quirk, are you serious? He cried, I really thought you were here to apologize. But you've only made it worse. K okay, kid, listen. Are you even listening to yourself? Midoriya almost slumped down at that point, but used all his willpower to remain standing. Did you come here to tell me I can only be a hero with your power? There just isn't any other way you. Didn't anybody actually see me fight the villain? I subdued the villain long enough to rescue Kakin, and kept him and myself from getting hit by any of his attacks. The boy could feel the steam pouring out of his ears. That was more than any of those other heroes did and I didn't need a quirk during any of it. With every word, the boy lost his will to fight he knew he didn't need the validation of anyone to be a hero. But it hurt him to have to deal with his former idol like this. I just can't believe this. Midoriya couldn't bear to look the man in the eyes anymore. If you really were in that crowd, then you should have seen firsthand what I can do. I bet you don't even believe that I took out the sludge villain on my own in the underpass. All Might didn't answer, but he didn't have to for his thoughts to clearly come through. Look, I'm just going to go home, he said dejectedly. I won't tell anyone about the nature of your quirk, since you've made it obvious that it can be passed down or something. The green-haired child turned around, but lifted his head up high he was ready to leave and end this awful day so was Gami. Look kid, I think you should reconsider. All Might was scarily like Kakin, they both just didn't know when to quit. You're not going to be able to get anywhere when your records say quirkless you'll just be spinning in circles until you've lost all the energy to keep going I can see your potential. And that's why I'm offering you my quirk hell, just the fact that it's my quirk should have you excited. Midoriya's head whipped back towards the frail man so fast. He was afraid it'd just snap off his neck, how dare you. You can't see any of my potential if you're so stuck on the fact that I don't have a quirk you can keep your crappy quirk for all I care, even if it guarantees me a spot at UAS Hero Course. The teen was so angry. He didn't even have to fight back any tears how could the number one hero, the man who inspired so many people in and even out of the country, have such flawed logic. He was ready to leave and then the man just pulled him back with something even more stupid. It baffled him, but he was too furious in the moment to contemplate it. I'd rather rely on my own skill and fail, he ranted, than need a pity handout to succeed because even if I fail, I'll just get back up and try again no one will be able to keep me down. Not UA, not the Hero Association, not even society itself. And that's exactly how I'll become a hero. He turned his head back forward, and unfortunately missed the number one hero gape like a fish out of water Gami didn't though, and reveled in the sight. I could go on and on about how utterly wrong you are or how utterly wrong you're going to be. He clutched one of his backpack straps tightly in one hand, shaking with rage so badly, he knew All Might could see it, but I don't have to. He took a confident step forward, away from the pro and towards his house he still didn't face the man, not wanting to lose his morale at realizing he was practically back-talking the number one hero in the country. He still heard no word from All Might. Not that he wanted to the man had disappointed him enough and each comment that escaped his mouth only fueled the boy's fury. Not even Gami broke the silence, eager to see where his successor was going with this. The silence simply infected the air, so thick that he could cut it cleanly with his sigh. And then, Midoriya walked away. He turned down a deal that, in another universe, would bring him to UA with a completely different mindset somewhere else. He had accepted his idol's offer and received a quirk that could only be described in Legends but this wasn't that universe, and Midoriya wouldn't take the infamous one for all. He would simply walk away, but not without finishing his comment a statement that would plague the pro hero's mind for far longer than the boy did earlier in the day a declaration that would become the backbone for everything the teen stood for and the change he represented. Just watch me. 
The first few nights after the sludge villain incident were difficult for Midoriya the school had given the students a couple days off. Considering that two of their students were so directly involved in the attack of course, the boy knew they were more worried about Bakugo. But it didn't bother him as much as it would have in the past he definitely could admit. It was hard getting adjusted to the fact that those outside opinions didn't matter anymore before. The teen would have been upset, and rightfully so, that the school wasn't concerned about his well-being or I guess, more concerned about Bakugo than him but now, he wasn't as focused on what Aldera was saying or what they did if they didn't care about him. That was alright. That was okay. Tonight was a late night for the duo, and as tiring as they were, Midoriya favored them over the nights he got his sorting done early these first nights after the attack were emotionally draining on the boy. But he enjoyed the conversation Gami eased him into it helped him forget the amount of trauma he went through on that day he could never remember how the conversations would start, or what they would be about all he could really recall was just the sensation of talking, the feeling of a smile blooming on his face or a short giggle that he would have to muffle so his mother didn't wake up he would always go to sleep feeling at peace with himself maybe not exactly happy, but content in the moment. He never knew what Gami did while he was asleep if the spirit slept along with him or just floated off into the night and returned before he got up whatever it was. It was comforting to see the spirit messing with his blinds or looking at one of his notebooks when Midoriya woke up. He really couldn't have asked for a better companion to be stuck with he was so grateful that the ghost put up with his emotional crises and teenage angst, but he really didn't have the time to be contemplating his lucky relationship with the spirit. Not while running to school in hopes of making it on time this was the only downside of those fabled late nights, the dreaded risk of oversleeping. How much longer until the bell? Midoriya panted. About nine minutes. Gami replied calmly, casually floating next to his successor as he ran it was an odd sight to witness if anyone actually could. A specter flying next to a sprinting child you can make it if you cut through the alleyway ahead. The teen shuddered he wasn't too fond of alleyways as of late ever since he watched Bakugo so close to death in one. He was particularly keen on avoiding them but he also couldn't afford to be late on the first day back to school from the mini break, so he sucked up his complaints and skidded to a turn. The alleyway was dark. Despite it being early morning he could pick out some discarded boxes and overflowing dumpsters that leaned against the building walls, but nothing out of the ordinary that reassured the middle schooler as he flew down the path, holding onto his backpack straps to ensure that it didn't fall off. He knew this alleyway though Midoriya used it all the time as a shortcut to school when he was late and he wasn't about to let a single bad experience stop him. As he approached the end of his shortcut, he could make out a thick wooden fence considering he had decayed the old one when he was about eight. It didn't surprise him to see it the first time he did it first. Getting over the fence was a bit time-consuming and made the boy nearly stop using the path, but like all things, he eventually figured out a way around the problem. Stepping firmly on his right foot, he used his momentum as a springboard to launch himself onto one of the dumpsters he used to stumble the first few times he attempted the jump. But now, it was just instinct he ran across the top of the trash bin and made another leap of faith off of it the bin was always just close enough that he could make it over the fence. As long as he didn't hesitate. That is, he'd learned that lesson the hard way for the first month. But after enough scratches and bruises, he could now make the jump with ease. Besides, it felt relieving to just take that leap it made his heart skip a beat when he felt himself soar over the fence like he had a jumping quirk or a strength enhancement won the breeze that rushed through his evergreen hair gave him sensation of flying it always made him proud to know he could make the jump, even without a quirk. Landing steadily on both feet, Midoriya continued his mad dash for the school but because of that shortcut, he was confident he would make it on time he hushed out a short cheer of relief and shook his fist in delight. Kami chuckled at his successor's antics despite being a teenager. He knew that the boy acted more like a bubbly child than anything else many would disagree, claiming that the teen was way too reserved and quiet to be referred to as bubbly. But the spirit knew he was one of the few that really got to see the boy's true nature when he was witnessing one of his favorite heroes in action or analyzing an interesting quirk. Midoriya was comparable to an excited puppy in the spirit's opinion. It made him wonder why the world was so bent on crushing him and his dreams. We're here, the teen whispered gleefully, time. Gami snapped to attention at the question he hadn't noticed that they had arrived at the school during his internal reflection six minutes until the bell. Oh that's good, he sighed out with a smile on his face, but the hallways are oddly full for so close to the bell. The ghost looked around. But his observations only confirmed Midoriya's statement the hallways were pretty packed with students. All whispering and sneaking glances at the boy the man realized fairly quickly what they were likely talking about looking back over to his successor, he knew the boy realized it as well. The green-haired teen squirmed uncomfortably he never liked being the center of attention and he definitely knew he was with the amount of stares on him sure. He wasn't surprised considering that the local news was just one of the many platforms that did capture his image during and after the attack but that didn't make him feel any less awkward. 
He knew that returning to school after the incident wouldn't be too pleasant he was worried what his peers might do once they realized he was the sole individual who acted to save Bakugo Gami did his best to comfort the teen during his time off from school, reminding him that their opinions didn't define him anymore, but no amount of schooling could prepare him for that uncomfortable feeling that crept up his spine. Midoriya slinked himself into his homeroom class, clutching his backpack straps carefully despite the mass amount of students that wandered the halls so close to the bell. He could tell that all of his classmates were in the room. Almost waiting on his arrival the boy paused in the doorway. Looking around at the other kids in the room they were all acting similarly to the ones in the hallway peering at him with hushed murmurs but he noticed one major difference separating his classmates from the other kids he'd seen in the halls. His class was snickering. His brows furrowed at that realization and Gami tensed, alerting him that the man had spotted the same thing what was so funny. The teen took slow steps into the room, towards his desk, but his eyes were anywhere but he turned his head to meet the stares of the kids he walked past, but the minute he looked in their direction, they lurched away and giggled harder he knew that there would be an adverse reaction to his presence. But Midoriya was definitely not expecting laughter. He looked in the general area of the teacher's desk, but was surprised to see no one there. It wasn't odd for the teacher to come in close to her even after the bell rang. But he was certain that the teacher would want to be in the room early on the first day back. The boy just sighed and moved his gaze elsewhere. He really shouldn't be shocked at the teacher's behavior anymore. His eyes settled onto a large, spiky head of blonde hair but his stare wasn't met by another after looking around. Midoriya realized that Bakugo was the only student not looking at him actually. It seemed that the angry teen was purposely trying to avoid making eye contact that didn't surprise him. After all, he was sure that Bakugo hadn't gotten over the whole sludge villain incident yet or the fact that he had technically saved his life, but he could definitely tell that the blonde was listening to everything going on in the classroom by the way his head was tilted. Midoriya's slow steps came to a halt once he approached his desk strangely. So did the snickers and whispers both he and the spirit gazed around again. And this time, all eyes seemed to be on him. His classmates were watching him intently, waiting for him to react to something. His gloved hands let go of his backpack straps and moved towards his desk. He figured that someone in his class had done something to his seat in an attempt to embarrass him. Maybe someone had loosened a screw or put some gum on the chair. Nothing too out of the ordinary. But as his eyes finally laid on his desk to search for whatever was making the class laugh, he felt his hands go cold. On the top of his wooden desk, a vibrant red spider lily lay almost daintily across. Midoriya took a step back in horror. His throat running dry his hands stayed raised in front of his chest, unsure of whether to go back to his straps or to his sides but he couldn't tear his eyes away from the flower. As much as he willed himself to he could hear the laughter pick up from all corners of the classroom. He and Gami did their best to prepare the boy for all sorts of situations regarding his return to Aldera, but both were surely not expecting this. Just hope for a quirk in your next life and go take a swan dive off the roof. Midoriya's classmates always made it painfully obvious how much they relied on the blonde for guidance, especially when it came to confronting the green-haired boy. Once Bakugo started calling the teen Deku, so did the rest of his peers. Once Bakugo started verbally bullying the teen, so did the rest of his peers. Once Bakugo started physically attacking the teen, so did the rest of his peers. But not even Bakugo had gone as far as to tell him to kill himself. His classmates always waited for Bakugo to take the first step, before rushing to follow him so now that he had, the rest of the students figured they had free reign as well. Midoriya wasn't sure how long he had been standing there. But Gami finally snapped the boy out of his head. He refused to meet the glances of his classmates and give them any more satisfaction than they were undoubtedly receiving. You saved a life, Izu. The man ushered him to move, to react, to do something. You are a hero, despite what they believe. The boy could only nod subtly, eyes still stuck on the flower and glazed over he made. No move to sit down at the desk. Gami turned to observe the class in secret. They were still snickering and eyeing his successor. The spirit shook in rage. Just wondering who was the little brat who decided to leave a spider lily on his friend's desk he looked over to the two kids who joined Bakugo that fateful day after school the kid with the long finger quirk was grinning widely and whispering to a few other kids around him the ghost was sure it was him who left the unwelcome present he strided over in that direction, focusing his fury in hopes that he could flip the kid's desk once he arrived. But a sudden creak of the classroom door drew all the attention away from the stunned teen. Midoriya, what are you doing out of your seat? The homeroom teacher inquired. Immediately focusing on the only standing student, just because you involved yourself in a villain attack doesn't give you any excuse to disrupt the class. The class turned back to him and quiet giggles could be heard, but Midoriya still struggled to react his head was spiraling further and further into darkness, and his hands were still shaking but it wasn't until he felt the ghost put his bony hand on the small of his back was he able to will himself to move to his desk he flung his bag off his shoulder and sat down in his chair, still not having moved the flower the class and even the teacher watched and waited for the boy to do something. 
His hand hovered over the long stem and his fingers rattled in uncertainty ever so slowly. His gloved hand wrapped around the flower and gently lifted it off his desk he didn't even spare the plant a glance as he almost carefully placed it into his tattered backpack he then pulled out his school books and positioned them neatly where the lily once laid he rested his hands softly on the edge of his desk and waited with a blank, empty stare. For the class to start he was sure his peers, nor the teacher, expected such a lack of a reaction, but the man finally began the class. Gami had hoped that this would be a one-time thing, but as the days passed, the two kept finding more and more lilies waiting for him on his desk that first day. It had only been one, but now, Midoriya could expect to find two or three flowers each day when he got to school but unlike that first day, the teen barely made a face at the sight he simply would walk over to his seat, put the flowers away in his bag, and sit down but that didn't deter the students from leaving them. Today was the first day the flowers came with a note though. He got a better look at the letter on his desk as he got closer it was folded over, contents completely hidden and less open the note was also tied to the small bouquet of spider lilies with a silky red ribbon it looked so elegant. Midoriya figured it could have been mistaken for a love letter if not for the choice of flowers, but he knew it was most certainly not a confession of passion he was convinced that he would never be lucky enough to receive one. He could feel the eyes on his form as he opened up the paper, but he made no confirmation of that acknowledgement inside was writing. Scrawled and messy, black marker the lettering was thick and large enough for the sloppy handwriting not to be a problem. Concerning legibility, finish what that villain started. Midoriya took a shaky swallow before pocketing the note. Then putting the flowers away as he normally did he did his best not to react and urged Gami to do the same. Despite no one being able to see the spirit said Spectre reluctantly followed his successor's instructions. Although eager to tear apart the classroom the man never viewed himself as a violent individual. He just insisted that this middle school brought out the worst in him. As for the contents of the note, the boy knew that it wasn't a rogue call to villainy the flowers alone confirmed that besides, even if it was, he was too far deep into achieving his dreams of heroism one singular note wasn't going to be the final push after he'd survived ten years of pain and hate. It was a call for his end, but as nice as it might have been to answer that call, the teen knew it wasn't even possible so he continued on with his day as normal, tuning in and out of lessons he was eager to leave the school and enjoy some time alone and by alone. He met with Gami, watching whatever hero cartoons were airing unfortunately, he figured there may be some complications with getting home as early as he wanted to. And by complications, he, of course, meant a group of Bakugo's lackeys. The kids had gotten the chance to ambush him by his usual way home, since the teacher had held Midoriya back for some minuscule issue but the boy was quick on his feet and attempted to run in the opposite direction to lose them the group didn't give up chase them, and hastily followed after him he figured that among the group must be the writer of the letter, and they might not have been happy over his calm facade the note was probably an attempt to stir some sort of reaction out of him. Making a split-second decision, he ducked behind an alleyway dumpster and held his breath. He could hear a stampede of footsteps rush past his hiding spot, but luckily, they didn't stop he didn't reveal himself right away though, just in case, the group came back in his direction. But after a few minutes, he eventually left the alleyway wandering the afternoon streets. Midoriya realized he didn't recognize the area he was now at. Hey Gami, do you know where we are? He asked the spirit. 